based upon data, um, this change in what we're doing has been absolutely um, phenomenal, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share um, the, those ideas and thoughts and that we're getting things done. That's really important in this process. So any other questions? All right, hearing no other questions, Mr. Jones, okay. what's next? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So what we'll do next is we will have a CBI uh, update and again to the uh, uh, Business and Workforce Development Committee. Uh, this was pushed back to the forefront back in the June timeframe to make sure that some of the recommendations from the 2017 evaluation were brought before the council. So um, at this point, we'd like to give you updates on the annual report as well as where we are heading in the future. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Phil. I think, can you? The Department of General Services and I, am I am on. Um, standing with me tonight is Sean Thomas, Assistant Program Manager of the City's Charlotte Business Inclusion Program. And it's our pleasure tonight to present to you the highlights of the Charlotte Business Inclusion Fiscal Year 2019 Annual Report. And this is a report that uh, you all received in your packet, I think, in early July. So I'm going to kick off the presentation and I'm going to ask Sean then to share with you the results of the report and then I'll return to wrap it up. But before I get started, I just wanted to pause a moment and acknowledge that while this report will present good news tonight, many of our small businesses in Charlotte are struggling, including our minority businesses. So it's times like these that make the work of our Charlotte Business Inclusion Program uh, around equity in contracting to be very important. Next slide, please. So for the sake of the audience, I just wanted to start by very quickly reviewing the purpose of the CBI program. The mission of the CBI program is to promote diversity, inclusion, and local business opportunities in cities contracting and procurement process for businesses in the Charlotte region. We do this by certifying minority women and small business enterprises we set minority women and small business enterprise utilization goals. We track and report against those goals. We conduct education and outreach to build capacity. We engage with our stakeholder groups and we partner with departments to increase opportunities for MWSB participation. So now let me turn it over to Sean Thomas and she'll walk you through some of our results. Thank you, Director Rieger. Good evening, Mayor Lyles and members of council. CBI is working collaboratively with its community partners to increase its pool of city certified vendors. CBI has specifically concentrated its efforts to recruit minority business enterprises in contract areas with low MBE availability. These strategic efforts have resulted in increased year-over-year -year spending with city-certified vendors. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. For the first time in the history of the program, the city has over 1,000 certified vendors in its database. CBI continues to connect with prime contractors, trade organizations, chamber groups, private diversity and inclusion organizations, and other community partners to increase the pool of city certified firms. Next slide, please. The subcontracting spend with certified vendors for the same time period, fiscal year 2018 to 2019, increased by over $18 million, a 44% increase. The city of Charlotte increased spending with city certified prime contractors by 22% from FY 2018 to FY 2019. CBI continues its collaborative efforts to break down work and increase opportunities for certified firms to become prime contractors. Next slide, please. While the city had a record spend of $32 million with MBEs in construction, more work needs to be done to connect our MBE firms with 
professional, architectural and engineering, other services opportunities. CBI continues to work collaboratively to find right-size informal opportunities for certified firms. This strategy helps to remove the experience barrier for our certified firms and connect them with contracting opportunities. Next slide, please. Of the city's $133 million spend with certified primes and subs, over $42 million were spent with minority business enterprises. And more than 55% of the MBE spend of $42 million was with certified African-American firms. Next slide, please. CBI is introducing a new metric for fiscal year 2019. We will list the certified firms that had an annual spend greater than $1 million. The city spent over $1 million with 22 certified firms, eight of which are MBEs and three WBEs. Next slide, please. CBI also continues its commitment to help prepare certified firms for contracting opportunities with the city through education and project forecasting. Next slide, please. And in closing, fiscal year 2019 was a year of growth in certifications, prime and sub spending, educational opportunities, and outreach activities. However, as fiscal year 2020 brings additional challenges for our city certified firms, CBI will continue to implement evidence-based and data-driven strategies that connect our certified firms to city contracting opportunities. Thank you. Are there any questions? I want. I just want to say, Sean, you ran through that, and I want to you to go back a couple of things that, to just remind us. We spent a lot of money, over a million dollars, with how many firms? Twenty-two, I believe you said. Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Yep. Um, you are breaking out um, minority African-American owned businesses as a part of your reporting. Um, a lot of improvements that have been made. So, Sean, next time, slow it down and celebrate a little bit, okay? Yes, Mayor. All right. Thank you. Mr. Jones? I think Bill's coming back. Okay. So, if I could just really quickly, uh, Mr. Jones, if we could go to the next slide, I just wanted to say a few um, thank yous. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without um, effective uh, collaboration with our partners. And so I just wanted to thank the Workforce and Business Development Committee for their feedback and support along the way. Specifically, I wanted to thank Committee Chair James Mitchell, Vice Chair Tark Bukhari, and Committee Members Dipple, Ashmira, Malcolm Graham, and Renee Johnson. I'd also like to recognize the hard work of the Charlotte Business Inclusion Advisory Committee. This committee's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the work of CBI has been extraordinarily impactful to uh, the successful results that we've been able to share tonight. It's just great news. And so if we could go to the next slide. Finally, I'm just extraordinarily excited to announce the hiring of our newest team member tonight. Um, as a result of a national search, We've hired Stephen Coker of Syracuse, New York, to be Charlotte's next CBI program manager. Uh, Steve has 20 years of relevant experience, including work experience that spans public, private, and the academic sectors. Steve's first day will be next Monday, August 17th. And I can tell you that he's really excited to meet our community and to begin building relationships within our contracting and small businesses community specifically. And because I know that Steve is watching tonight, uh, I'd just like to ask you to join me in virtually congratulating Steve and welcoming him to Charlotte. And so with that said, uh, I turn it back over to Manager Jones and Mayor Lyles, and if there are any additional questions, we'd be happy to answer. Mr. Jones. So, uh, so thank you, Mayor. This is uh, something that I know is uh, near and dear to the uh, hearts of the um, committee, um, the committee, and I believe we have the right individual who can lead us as we start to uh, go back and revisit some of the things that we have done 
and worked on in the past, such as uh, capacity building and collaboration between a department. So I am convinced, Mayor, that the, the committee chairman may have something to say, and I will uh, move <laughs> away. All right, I think you've been recognized, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Manager and the Council. Uh, let me first of all thank the staff for all their hard work. Uh, the Workforce, De uh, Workforce Development Business uh, Committee really made this a top priority. Phil, Kay, and Sean, you guys really stepped up to the plate and increased our numbers. I have to thank the City Council as well. Many times when we had our, uh, agenda items, Council were very passionate to make sure we can increase participation, increase the goals, and so it's been a team effort. Uh, City Manager, really thank you. Um, uh, th this has been a day that I've been looking forward for quite some time uh, to find a, a, a CBI uh, program manager to replace Nancy. So thank you, sir. Thank you for doing a nationwide search. Uh, I promise uh, not to bug Steve on his first day. Uh, <laughs> but after that. that, he may not mean that, Steve. So. <laughs> <laughs> But after that, sir, there's no, uh, there's no guarantee. No, thank you for everyone, and, and thank you for all the work we've done in the CBI program to, to be a program that is known throughout the state of North Carolina being a top program. Okay, Steve, on behalf of all of us, we are glad to have you come to Charlotte and look forward to the work that you're going to do. We're a great place that always thinks about what we do well, but how we can do better. So thank you for joining our team. Any questions um, on the um, CBI annual report? Any comments? All right, with that, Mr. Jones, you can, okay, we keep, so, uh, we still have some time. Awesome, so Mayor, members of council, uh, if we can go to the next uh, presentation or update, transit and transportation, that will catch us up with where we were from last week and uh, actually put us back on uh, time in terms of the, the public forum and the new information that we have for you tonight. So with that said, I will turn this over to Taiwo. Thank you very much, my name is Jones. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I know we, um, last time you saw myself, Liz, and John present to you was um, at the council retreat uh, back in January. Uh, about mobility, accessibility, and connectivity. So we'd like to give you an update today. So if you would go with me to the next slide and next slide after that. Uh, so the focus obviously was on mobility and accessibility and how we make sure that we improve connectivity uh, in our city, uh, at least beginning this year, how, to, uh, how we uh, launch programs that will improve our mobility or congestion but also improving reliability and efficiency of our transit system while we continue to also have a better understanding of the funding climate, uh, both at the state and the federal level, and how we can really together with you discuss those and evaluate uh, funding mechanisms uh, for really improving congestion or even improving our transit system. Next slide. Uh, two things that came out of that retreat uh, were, number one, the um, establishment of a task force that was largely charged with translating our vision for mobility in the Charlotte region to one of uh, implementation. And so a 25-member task force uh, headed by former Mayor Harvey Gant was formed back in February of this year. And they started to meet in May of this year uh, on a monthly basis. At the last meeting, we had uh, guests from Nashville, Tennessee, Austin, uh, Texas, and uh, Broward County in Florida uh, to share with us their experiences. Goal of this uh, task force essentially is to deliver what we call a transformational mobility network of a magnitude that will really change the way we uh, move around and we connect in the Charlotte region, uh, particularly focusing on, on the city as well. Um, next slide. But one thing that also came out of it, which uh, you've heard a great deal about in the last several weeks, is the corridors of opportunities. How we identify those six corridors and where transportation, transit, and planning can really team up with housing and economic development 
to create complete corridors. Uh, we identified six corridors of opportunities where we can continue to provide the platform to leverage what we've invested in these corridors uh, in the last several years, but also provide platform uh, for doing great things uh, in the future. But of course, next slide uh, shows us that um, our world changed uh, after the pandemic. And so while we were thinking that this will be in the words of a mayor pro tem, the year of uh, mobility, uh, it quickly became uh, a different focus for us. So by March and April of this year, our experiences were different, which was why we paused uh, on meeting with the Charlotte uh, Moves Task Force until May. And then we also did not really get on the corridors of opportunities until very recently. But like many other cities in the world, uh, particularly in our country, we started to look at how do we activate the public space that will focus more on pedestrians and encouraging people uh, to go out while respecting uh, the CDC guidelines on whether wearing masks or even um, maintaining the six feet social distances while at the same time we're supporting our businesses. So we uh, were able to quickly pivot and do certain things uh, while you know the, the pandemic is still uh, here with us. Uh, we launched three initiatives. The first one on the next slide being the uh, shared streets. We launched the first phase on, on the 9th of um, May and it has been successful. Uh, we did a survey and over 60% of the community felt that this is the type of thing they would like to see uh, in their city. The second phase was launched, therefore, on um, June 27. Just for those of you uh, who uh, are watching, Shared Street is really an opportunity to uh, create uh, environments on our city streets where pedestrians and people are using, uh, riding on their bicycles or even if they are wheelchair restrained or uh, you know, strolling with their babies, are able to share the same streets with um, vehicles. Now, those streets are closed to through vehicles, except for emergency uh, vehicles, but they are definitely allow for people to have activities on those streets. The third phase actually was supposed to launch last weekend, but we're moving it to this weekend. So the date there is, uh, is not correct, it's August 15th. And then in the fourth phase of it, we'll do an evaluation on how can we um, have a sense of permanence uh, once you know this uh, period that we're in is over. The second initiative on the next slide um, is uh, outdoor dining and street eateries program. Uh, really the outdoor dining is about how do we support our current businesses. So far we've got about 18 businesses that have registered at least through um, last month. Uh, we continue to have interest in this. I guess the first two will be the one on, on North Bryan, as well as um, Thomas uh, Street. But we continue to encourage this. This is not something that uh, Charlotte alone is doing. But again, it's another way not only to activate our city streets and public spaces, but also to encourage and support businesses, especially now that the second phase has been extended. How can we support business? Now, this is not going to encourage restaurants or bars to open between 11 p.m. and 8 a.m. because of the uh, city's noise ordinance, but it does allow them to be able to utilize, um, whether it's parking spaces or other opportunities within their establishments to be able to encourage people to sit outside, maintaining CDC guidelines, not more than 25% occupancy in each uh, restaurant. The next slide actually shows that we're not the only one uh, doing that. Uh, in, in, pretty much uh, throughout the country. The city of Belmont uh, has an outdoor dining program that closes its main street to vehicles every Friday. I actually think that um, Charlotte should be setting and, and leading this, and I wish that we are doing more uh, of this, uh, but hopefully uh, we're able to get things set up uh, quicker in the next several weeks so that our businesses and our residents can take advantage of this. On the next slide, is our shared street murals. Prior to COVID-19 actually hitting us, we, we part of our placemaking program was to launch a murals on our streets. But what COVID-19 has done is as we created the shared street, we also wanted to make sure that people who use the shared streets have a sense of vibrancy on those streets as well. So we created murals in association with a few of those streets 
but we've been able to implement in the month of June alone, 15 neighborhoods with about $15,000 in our placemaking program to our local uh, Charlotte artists uh, that have done some tremendous uh, work in um, painting our street with murals that allows vehicles to slow down, but it also allows our citizens to um, exhibit their creativity by you know, activating again the public space. Perhaps the most well-known of these street murals is on the next slide, and that's the Black Lives Matter mural uh, up, uptown, uh, between 300 and 400 block of North Tryon, which was done on June 9th, and that street was closed subsequently on June 12th uh, uh, through September 30. This, was, um, this really engaged about 17 different local artists. Uh, part of, uh, we funded with part of the leftover dollars in our placemaking program. And we paid about $500 per artist per letter. Of course, one of those letters has two artists for those of you who are calculating. Um, but it's been a community gathering place. And I would say like my colleague, Michael Smith, a center city partner said, it's become a sacred place uh, and a healing spot, uh, spot for our city. Our next slide actually shows that while other cities in North Carolina have done that, we actually set the tone uh, in this state for something of this nature. And we expect that um, other cities, frankly speaking, cities of as far away as Seattle and Portland were reaching out to us and calling us, as far away as Palo Alto in California, asking us uh, if we would um, you know, uh, share with them our experience. And those of you who are basketball fans may notice that that particular mural was displayed uh, when NBA opened uh, in Orlando uh, several days ago. And so it's really uh, gone beyond what we celebrate in Charlotte to something that's celebrated nationally. Next slide. At this point, I will turn this to uh, John Lewis, who will walk us through the uh, what he's been doing with regards to the uh, transit piece of the update. Thank you. I um, I wonder if we might, because it's five o'clock, almost five, if we could go ahead and just do our um, public forum and then have cats come back. John is, I don't see him at the podium, but I think if we could go ahead and get our, our um, public forum and those public hearings out of the way, is that is that will that work? So um, the manager says that that will work for us. So I have it, one question for Ty. Um, so it, it, he'll it, be it, back. Do you want to do the question now? Um, whatever, whatever works for the for the good of the order. Well, I'm trying to get the five o'clock because we told people to come at five for the public forum to get that done and those hearings. So we'll do that and then come back. So jot your question down in your head and we'll get back to you really, really quickly, I'm sure. So with that, um, I'm going to, um, I think all of the council members have a list of the speakers. Um, so the speakers will have three minutes each since we have 10 people tonight. And so we'll begin with um, Mr. Lee. Mis Mr. Lee is not with us. Mr. Lee did not join us. I, I, I'm here. I'm oh. here. Oh, see, I see Donata was, she, this is the first time she's made a mistake in her life, Mr. Lee. She's never made this yeah, mistake. I, I, I've this, been on here for an hour, so I've been waiting to speak with you because I haven't seen you in so long. I really miss all of you. Thank I you so much. Family, yeah, I hope and pray that your families are safe. All right, so um, I, if you, I was, with that, we'll start your um, three minutes. Um, the clerk will tell Buzz if you get past the three minutes, Mr. Lee. Ready? Uh, yes. Okay, let's go. All right, first of all, like I say, I miss you guys. I hope that everybody's being safe. You know, I'm still working in the trenches with the census, and we're feeding people in the communities. Um, but I want to talk to you about Mayor Brookshire. Um, if you don't know, he was a mayor that we had in a very turbulent time in history uh, during the 60s, um, Vietnam. So it was very turbulent, but he stood up as the leader. He did a lot of the right things at the, at the right time when a lot of people didn't want him to. Mayor Lyles, you have an opportunity to go down in the history, in the annals of the history of Charlotte as a mayor that helped us get off the bottom. We know that you guys have, uh, uh, you know about the restorative justice CLT resolution that's going to be before you soon. 
And we're asking you to read that because just with this one act, you will be off from 50 to 49 just with this one act. So uh, we hope that you look at that. Mr. Lee, is Hello? that your cell phone? Hello? No, that's not my cell phone. That's okay. somebody else. All right. So Keep can going. I get one more minute? Because that was very. <laughs> We we'll give you we'll give you a few seconds more. Go ahead. That works. But but I was just saying that Mary Lyles, you you and your council will have an opportunity to go down in the annals of the history of Charlotte as the the board, the people that was that were um, had the courage to help turn this thing around in Charlotte, the upper mobility piece and the and the resolution that uh, the restorative justice. Um, is asking you to look at is something that's going to be like the first step and what we're, you know, and, and getting us off the bottom. So I miss you guys. I thank you for this opportunity. I hope to see you soon. Come out and see me at the census caravans. Peace out. Thank you very much. Peace out. Here you go. All right. Our next speaker is Jensie Baker. Jensie Baker, can you can go thank, you can go ahead and start. We I know that she's on the line. It's just we can't hear her. She dropped off. So. Oh, so she's dropped off. Okay. All right. So Miss Baker, we'll, if she gets back, we'll come back to her. All right. Leo Aman, Mr. Aman. Thank you. Can you y'all hear me or? Is this, a, is this Miss Baker? No, this is not Miss Baker. This is Miss Amon. Oh, Miss Alon. This is Amon. Yes, this is Leo Amon. Okay, Leo Amon. I am so sorry. I did not pronounce your name correctly. But it's, it's fine. I don't care. Okay. All right, Mr. My name is Leo Amon. I live in two districts, District 1 and 4. Even though I can't vote, I still have good... Advice. I can still give good advice to my parents. My main topic tonight are bullying and black li bullying and Black Lives Matter and the police budget. Oh my God! I want to know why so much of the budget is going to the police because the police do not help us that much, especially people darker than me. About the bullying, Ms. Ashmira is being bullied by some council bear member members, and that is not fair. Some of you. And you know who you are need to quit bullying Mrs. Merrick. Especially she fights for the climate and environment. That means she fights for my future. About that budget, I want to know why 40% of the budget is going to the police. Like I said, they do not help us that much. Example, my mom called the police when a racist neighbor trespassed on our porch and threatened her life because of our word art and design on our fence. They came and saw the video of him threatening my mom they did not include that in the report. In fact, they wrote it up as a complaint from our other neighbor who was also racist. There is no room for cops that do not take a single mother seriously. There is no room for racists on the city council, and I know there is, there is some in there. We need to fix that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. All right, Jody Bland, Ms. Jody Bland. <laughs> Miss Miss Bland, is she here? Okay. It's, we have a little bit more lag time in this space, so. Miss Miss Bland. Okay. We'll come back to Miss Bland. All right. Desiree Miller. Miss Miller. Desiree Miller. Good good evening. It's Desiree Miller. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Just want to double check, make sure you guys can hear me. We can. Thank you. Okay, great. Transparency, accountability, and good stewardship. These are three core values that as citizens of Charlotte, we expect from this council. We also expect that you would treat your fellow colleagues on council with the same respect and professional courtesy, regardless of their party affiliation, that you would expect for yourself. 
Dimple Ajamira, I find it shameful and hypocritical that you would make bold accusations to discredit and question the ethics of Councilman Tark Bakari. I believe this is your attempt to draw attention away from some of your questionable behavior. It appears that you are using your official position as councilwoman to directly benefit where people in the real estate community are making donations to your campaign in return for receiving your support and vote in passing the rezoning request before the city. Where is the transparency there? I ask this council to hold an independent investigation in what appears to be Councilman Ajimera's own unethical behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Um, Kali Thompson. <clears throat> Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Please, you have three minutes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good evening, and thank you, Madam Mayor, for this opportunity. I'm going to speak on the same thing that Desiree Miller just brought up. I was going to address the ethics complaint recently filed by the NCGOP against James Mitchell and Dimple Ajmira. Ajmira's particular pattern of campaign contributions is an incident worthy of an independent investigation. She does appear to have abused her position of power to obtain donations from key business and property owners, which coincided with relevant zoning decisions. And this series of donations and their suspicious timing warrants a full independent investigation. When asked about the allegations, she called the line of questioning a sexist, racist political attack. Ms. Ajmer, you cannot use your identity as a shield against accusations of wrongdoing. Bottom line, the NCGOP is calling for an independent investigation of these council members. And as Desiree Miller quoted Ms. Ajmira, because she's the one who said these words, quote, we must insist on the transparency, accountability, and good stewardship of our public dollars. This is not a political situation. This is involving her actions and her actions alone. Thank you. Thank you. Katrina Letson. Ms. Letson is not on. Ms. Letson is not on. Um, Sean Odenall. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. If you'll go ahead and begin, you have three minutes. Yes, I just want to uh, repeat and um, in regard to the accusations that have been filed, um, raised against um, Councilman um, Tart, and even after he has, he went to the city manager, the attorneys and asked um, to, for full, um, full approval that there would be absolutely no conflict of interest, I, I just challenge um, Sazmira, uh, to uh, look at um, what she is accusing and um, Councilman Tark of doing, and also the accusations and the um, unethical behavior that she has demonstrated that, is, that has been documented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Odenhall. Um, Karen Allison. Ms. Allison is not with us. Ms. Allison is not. Cindy Decker. Ms. Decker. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. On July 27th, I helped organizers with a two-hour family-friendly rally in Marshall Park in support of law enforcement called Back the Blue. CMPD asked that they move to the park rather than the government center to avoid any conflict with another group protesting outside the jail. About an hour into the rally, a visiting African-American pastor was in the middle of leading the rally in prayer when the group from outside the jail descended upon the rally, grabbing flags out of people's hands, hitting one woman over the head, almost falling to, into the pond, unplugged the sound system, flipped over tables, pushed an elderly man to the ground, took property and shoved it into garbage cans, yelling their favorite obscenities in everyone's face and began to push the pastor away from the front until CMPD arrived and began to separate this group with their line of bikes, giving them an opportunity to move back in a way that they did not move. After having their bikes shoved back at them, an officer pulled out his can of pepper spray and sprayed it once to stop the madness, and the angry crowd began to move back and slowly left. Every media network labeled it some sort of showdown, as if both groups showed up in this place for a confrontation. 
That was a complete lie. This group came from the jail to harass and attack a peaceful group on permitted space. It was a shutdown, not a showdown. People were assaulted and their civil rights were trash. Parents fled with their terrified kids angry that on a Saturday afternoon, they weren't safe at a pro-police rally. All they have is questions about this group running the streets like some vigilante mob without consequence. And is justice only for one group's rights? This public display of such hostility to any opposing voice will ultimately discredit their message, but it is the wrong message for Charlotte. That said, when RNC groups come to this host city in support of this president, what is the strategy to stop this exact behavior from happening? What clear boundaries will be communicated to these activists that keep them from attacking and assaulting our visitors? What kind of strategy will you allow CMPD to deploy to protect our visitors and their rights? With all respect, Mayor and Council, it appears there is deference being shown to the loudest, nastiest, threatening activists in our city, and that is not the reputation Charlotteans are going to keep tolerating. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Um, we are actually going to have a briefing on the um, Republican National Convention later on the agenda. I would invite you to um, stay on the um, um, stay watch or stay continue to watch, and you'll be able to hear some of the um, thoughts of what we're doing during the RNC. All right, um, I do not have any further speakers signed up. We're we're okay. So then we are going to move to our public hearings. Just finding the public hearings, guys. It's a lot of stuff in this book tonight. All right. Our first item on our public hearing is um, a public hearing on a resolution to close a portion of West 25th Street. Um, is there anyone signed up to speak, Madam Clerk? We have no speakers. Um, you have, the hearing. We have a motion and um, a second to close the public hearing. So I'll start with Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Mr. Graham. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Is there anyone who objects to the, this motion? Hearing no, obje uh, no objection, the uh, motion passes unanimously. The item number eight is a public hearing on a resolution to close an alleyway between 23rd and 24th Streets. Is there anyone signed up to speak? Mm -hmm. Having no speakers, do I have a motion, motion to, to open hearing. and close the public hearing? Second. Close. We have a motion and a second. Um, Ms. Ashmira, I mean, Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Um, is there anyone who objects to closing of the public hearing? Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is a public hearing on a resolution to close an alleyway off Hawkins Street between West Worthington Avenue and West Boulevard. Is there anyone signed up to speak? All right, hearing, there's no one signed up to speak. I have a motion to, open, to close the public hearing um, and a second. So um, is there any comment? Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Watlington? We can't hear, we can't hear Ms. Watlington. All right. Yes. All right, Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Is there anyone that opposes um, the closing of the public hearing? Hearing no one in opposition, um, that ma motion passes unanimously. I'd like to um, go back. We had two, pe two speakers um, on our public hearing tonight. Mr. Lee and Ms. Um, Baker um, signed up to speak about a resolution 
around the issue of restorative justice and upward mobility. So I'd like to take a moment before the um, meeting starts on our business items and going back to our policy items um, to address this issue. Um, I sent many of you a memo telling you that um, this was an issue that was presented to me and I have addressed it in the following way. So first I want to um, make the statement is specifically around upward mobility and restorative justice. I acknowledge the histories and complexities of systemic racism and our city government's role in perpetuating those systems. I also acknowledge this council's commitment to equity, social justice, and our city's role to address our own systemic racism. As mayor, with the support of the Charlotte City Council, I want to thank the Greenspun Spun Institute Center for my own alma mater, Queens University, for their research and statement on upward mobility and restorative justice, as well as a request for an apology owed the African American residents of Charlotte for the actions taken under urban renewal laws of this country, displacing hundreds of African Americans on this land that we sit today as a center of government and other actions furthering the inequities of race in our city. I want to express my appreciation for Reverend Willie Keaton, Rabbi Judy Schindler, and former Mayor Jennifer Roberts for their unflagging energy to this effort. Mayor Roberts knows from her time in office that resolutions are important statements that have to be grounded in data, plans, and accountability. Again, I want to say about this council we have made a commitment to equity, social justice, and our role in systemic racism. Tonight, we ask our residents, businesses, and corporations, our philanthropic and faith communities, to commit to a city that is diverse and inclusive, requiring all of us to examine those actions and seek out remedies for bringing all races and ethnicities to the opportunity denied to us but yet afforded to others. And that is why I'm making this statement that we apologize to the African Americans who came before us and to those living in our city today. Our apology is grounded in the fact that Charlotte is a tale of two cities. We have great prosperity and great poverty. African Americans in our city did not achieve upward mobility due to our history of slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow, Re segregation as systemic racial discrimination of redlining, restrictive covenants, urban renewal. Charlotte lives with the impact of those laws, policies, and social determinants, resulting in health disparity, food insecurity, negative environmental impacts, and the resulting trauma. Charlotte's statistics show the result of deeply rooted structural barriers to upward mobility such as education, housing, criminal justice, transportation, and, and employment. And the city of Charlotte's government between 1960 and 1967 raised the book Brooklyn neighborhood, displacing over 1,000 families and nearly 10,000 residents, 216 black-owned businesses, and 11 houses of worship. The city of Charlotte atones for the past actions of our government that impeded the st stability and the well-being and progress of African-American residents. We ask the entire city to work with us in this moment and this time to change the course of our city to move forward on social justice and equity. And as a city, we will begin to take these steps to reduce trauma in our city with violence and eruption programs in our neighborhoods, to fund black businesses in our opportunity corridors to achieve economic advancement, support black entrepreneurs and build public infrastructure on Beatty's Ford Road, West Boulevard, Albemarle Road, North Tryon and Sugar Creek Roads. We commit to creating opportunity for jobs with working wages, diversity in hires and promotions, and to pay all city employees a working wage, and to ask our supply chain vendors to commit to the same. We develop partnerships with corporations, businesses, large and small, philanthropic, faith, and other governmental agencies to act to address racism with collective and collaborative actions. And we want to measure the results of change with transparency to our community. I want to thank all the people that live in our city and each member of the Charlotte City Council for understanding the past 
and moving forward for the future. And that's the statement that I make in response to the request for upward mobility and restorative justice from our city. So thank you for allowing us this moment to take and address that issue. It's an important one as we move forward. So with that, I'm going to ask the manager once again to go back to our agenda. So, so thank you, Mayor and members of council. We will queue back up um, Ty, who will hand it over to John Lewis. And we will have uh, Liz also round it out. And I just want to echo what Ty said. It's um, a lot of things are, are happening in the city. And the mobility is something that the council had as a top priority during the last annual strategy meeting. So to be able to, um, you know, eight months later to, to come back and show that progress has been made is important, as well as there are issues still out there that we have to address. And Mayor, with that said, I believe that Council Member Winston had a question of Ty. That's right. So, Mr. Winston, is Ty back up at the podium yet? He's yes, getting I there. Have. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Winston? Yes, uh, thank you. Let me pull the question up. Um, Ty, uh, you mentioned when you were talking about the streeteries um, that are popping up, um, you, uh, you mentioned that you wanted to see more of this get set up faster. Um, I, I know several council members, including this council member, uh, want this to happen as well. Business owners are looking for government to government for regulations that help them innovate in ways like this. Um, since all parties seem to be in line, what is preventing us from doing more of this faster? Uh, what can city council do to speed this up? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, as you know, uh, when you're in an environment like this, you definitely want to maximize creative ideas to support businesses, especially restaurants and bars, and of course, um, our residents. But it's also very important that we engage uh, businesses as well. So we're in the process of doing that. But of course, funding is also uh, part of that equation as well. So we are hopeful uh, that within the next several days as we walk through those two items, engaging, and also uh, the funding piece, we will um, begin to launch our, our street eateries program. We actually have the outdoor dining programs right now that a couple of restaurants have taken advantage of. It's really the, uh, the street eateries that we need to really, um, really focus more on. We're thinking of a couple of streets uh, right now. I think our conversation last week uh, between planning and, and uh, CDOT and uh, Center City Partners and ED focused on Camden, and uh, but we just want to make sure that we do this right. Uh, so because sometimes in an effort to do something good, there are unintended consequences, and so part of that is to make sure that we engage. But we also want to make sure that we don't do this end endless engagement where we just keep going on and on and on without coming to a conclusion. So hopefully, um, within the next few uh, weeks, we can. We would like to. Uh, definitely make sure that we partner with uh, Tracy Dodson, uh, um, our assistant city manager for economic development, and I believe she briefed the committee on workforce earlier today about this program. So ED, CDOT, planning, we're working closely together uh, to make sure that we launch this as soon as possible, but in the right way. Uh, may, I, may I follow up? Please. Um, yeah, um, so you mentioned two things. Um, you mentioned uh, funding and outreach is needed. Is this something city council can help with? Um, um, and, you know, I know a lot of business owners and advocates are, are looking at, hey, well, there are parking spots, on-street parking, that we could be converting into um, in, into eateries or, or spaces that uh, their patrons can, can utilize. Um, if I am that business owner that has this kind of idea, how do I do that as well? So two questions, how does city council help with that funding and outreach and what can business owners do right now if they are interested in converting on street parking? I think once the program is open, we will have an application process. So uh, folks can apply just like they've done for the outdoor dining program. I mentioned earlier that we've had 18 uh, businesses that have applied. So it will be right about the same thing. Yes, council can help and that the help really is about supporting. Uh, when we come before you with some of the ideas, we could take advantage of a number of uh, 
funding opportunities, but I want to make sure that I'm in alignment with um, what our Workforce and Business um, Committee has discussed this morning. And so uh, Tracy Dodson and I will be talking about this later tonight or sometime uh, this week to make sure that we have the right um, mechanism in place to get this going. We definitely want to do this. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but your support will be needed. Uh, but also just using this as an opportunity to communicate to restaurants that are interested that once we launch, we will do a citywide marketing uh, effort. This is not only going to be focused on center city. We want a citywide effort. There will be a marketing work that we will do that will allow people to know what we're trying to do so they can apply. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that we take advantage of what we have now, the extension of phase two of our reopening and, and support our businesses as well. Last question uh, or comment. Um, as we're looking to, to do this um, and understanding this is a pandemic response, um, I, I would like to see uh, if there are places where this makes sense for this to be a permanent solution, uh, that we also explore this. I would hate to uh, do something, put a time limit on it, and then do extra work um, um, on the backside, uh, on, the, on the end of it, uh, coming up with a solution that we could have thought of from the very beginning. All right. So we have a few other comments now. Ms. Watlington. I just wanted to say I absolutely love this. Um, I have residents who have come to me before about Camden in particular, so I'm very, very excited to see that this is moving forward. Um, and I'm happy to support it. So looking forward to seeing this come across the dais. Thanks for your hard work, Ty and Tracy. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. I'm just gonna pile on with all the compliments as well. <laughs> I'm really, thank you, uh, CDOT and planning, so, um, Liz and Tyro for working together on this, because as I talked to you guys about it, there were a lot of unintended consequences that we council members might not have even thought of but I really encourage the public to reach out and use this, this, use these amenities once they are opened up so that we can show that roads are not just for cars. Roads are public spaces for everyone. And so the more we can get people to really make the most of it, the more we stand a chance of being able to have uh, perhaps Camden be a permanent, uh, not that I'm putting it out there, but I am having Camden be a permanent um, streetery and, and being able to access that a little bit better for everybody. So thanks for all the effort uh, going into this. It's exciting. All right. I don't have anyone else um, t for the questions on this. So Mr. Jones, do we go to Mr. Lewis? Yes. So we'll go to uh, Mr. Lewis, but also to uh, the mayor and council. You'll find a reoccurring theme uh, in these presentations that because of the pandemic, we've had to think about doing things differently. Um, and that's even to the point of, I believe John is going to talk about that he had some 15 minute frequencies in some of his higher traveled corridors, which is one of those issues that was brought up during the annual strategy meeting. And um, this pandemic has you know, forced us into doing things a little differently much like streeteries or things that we talked about closing streets. And I remember even um, Mr. Eggleston had a grand idea about closing streets. So we'll continue to um, be innovative and creative as we address these issues. With that said, I'd like to turn it over to John. Thank you, Mr. Manager, uh, Mayor, members of council. I'm John Lewis, Executive Director of the Charlotte Area Transit System. I just wanted to give you an update on the progress that CATS has made over the last several months on some of the initiatives that we have designed and discussed over the last several years. Prior to the health uh, pandemic, uh, CATS was moving Monday through Friday an average of 80,000 uh, riders per day. Three quarters of those riders uh, Monday through Friday would get to from their origin to their destination on board a CATS bus. Um, this uh, was part of an effort in Vision My Ride to overturn a troubling trend that had been uh, plaguing cats for a number of years, and that was uh, continued uh, reductions in bus ridership. Uh, we saw reductions in, in ridership on bus uh, from FY15, 16, and 17 
During that same period, uh, rail ridership continued to rise. So that pointed to the effort that it wasn't that people weren't willing to take transit, it's just that the offerings and the structure of the system we were providing of mobility options wasn't meeting uh, our riders' needs. And so we launched the Envision My Ride program, which was uh, based on three pillars, uh, structure, frequency, and reliability, which was implemented in 2018. Uh, we first got the structure of our system right. We completely redesigned in the fall of 2018 uh, our bus system and went from a hub and spoke system that required so many of our uh, bus riders to come into the uptown area at the transit center, get off one bus, cross the center, get onto another bus, and leave the uptown area to reach their destination. We instead uh, implemented a more of a uh, cross-town grid pattern which enable people to make more cross-town connections without uh, having to transfer. The next phase of the program was in focusing on enhanced frequency. And Manager Jones mentioned uh, part of that initiative in February of 2020. We took four of our routes prior to the pandemic and increased frequency. That is the intervals between when buses come from one, uh, to a stop of uh, an average of 30 down to 15 minutes. And we were continuing to fund that over the years. Again, fund, now that we've gotten the structure of the system right, focusing on frequency, and with the next slide, the third pillar of that plan uh, focused on reliability. Now that we had gotten the system structure right, and we continued to invest in additional frequency so that our customers did not have to wait long periods of time between buses, it was still key that we uh, focused on reliability. Uh, more frequent buses that are stuck in the same gridlock that everyone else is stuck in uh, defeats the purpose of the investment we've made in this plan. And so uh, we started uh, with our bus only lane pilot, which was completed in December of 2019 on 4th Street, where uh, we took away one full lane of traffic and devoted that to bus, emergency vehicles, and bicycles. Uh, and that was a successful program. We're now in the midst of examining other corridors that we can implement uh, similar types of programs along with technology enhancements such as queue jumps that allow buses to get around uh, uh, car traffic at intersections, also traffic signal uh, priority that will allow our vehicles to get through intersections and continue on their trip uh, more quickly and reliably. But then with the next slide, uh, the pandemic hit uh, and while we focused initially uh, on the shock of the health pandemic and the reorganization of our, our system of mobility options, uh, the health crisis has since given us an opportunity to re-examine how we provide service post-pandemic. What will the world look like post-COVID-19? Uh, we're all uh, in the midst of changes to the workplace, uh, people are working uh, more often uh, remotely, whether that's from home or other remote locations. Will that continue and at what level uh, once the pandemic has concluded? Uh, what are the resulting changes in commuting patterns? Uh, and what will that do to our system as we potentially move from peak period service uh, to more of a flat service? Uh, looking back six months ago, uh, the, the method of putting uh, mobility options in street a lot of bus and train service on the street during the morning commute. We would drop off during midday uh, and ramp back up in the evenings. But as the work environment changes and people's schedules change, it may be that those peaks will go away and we end up with a more constant level of service throughout the day. And then second, we challenge ourselves and staff to really think about our service offerings in turn, rather than how many people we fill uh, the seats of our buses and trains, but rather than on the value that we provide to our community. Next slide. And in that, uh, as we worked uh, diligently uh, to respond to the uh, COVID-19, uh, we changed uh, from uh, just providing our normal mobility options to really supporting essential and frontline employees. We developed our essential service plan that focused on uh, higher capacity routes with more frequency, particularly on those routes that provided service to healthcare, facilities, employment, major employment centers, grocery stores, uh, and opportunity corridors. 
Uh, we moved, uh, as we restructured, we, in some cases, reduced service levels in some areas so that we could increase in others. And we pro pro focused specifically on those opportunity corridors that we have discussed uh, so much over the last several months. Five out of the six opportunity corridors are now uh, have service and bus routes that operate on 15 minute frequencies. Next slide. Of course, uh, one of the biggest yeah, projects that we've been talking about over the last years is moving the Link Silver Line project forward. The Silver Line locally preferred alternative was adopted uh, in 2018 and included the 26 mile corridor from the town of Matthews through uptown Charlotte, connecting along the west, uh, uh, the Wilkinson corridor to the city of Belmont in Gaston County. This is the largest single project in our region and connecting three uh, different counties. The Silver Line program encompasses three separate projects. The Silver Line design and environmental service uh, that focus on uh, refining the corridors, determining the station alignments, and really beginning to dig into the details of where the Silver Line uh, rail project will uh, uh, be built. Uh, the transit-oriented development planning study that will uh, encompass the lessons learned from the Blue Line extension and incorporate them into this project so that we can ensure not only that we meet the mobility options of this, of this region, but also focus on the other uh, community goals such as affordable housing and economic development. And how can we focus those efforts in a concerted plan to ensure that we maximize and leverage the investment that we're putting into the silver line into the future? And then, of course, uh, the, building on the popularity of the rail trail in South Charlotte, we want to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunity as we build out this corridor to include a rail trail uh, along as much of the corridor as possible. Uh, prior to COVID, we had in, embarked on a very aggressive stakeholder and public uh, outreach meetings. Uh, since then, we've had to pivot and go more virtual, and we're looking to continue those public outreach uh, into the fall. Next slide. And then uh, the City Links Gold Line. City Links Gold Line is a 10 mile modern streetcar system that is planned to link the community transit centers at Rosa Parks Place and Eastland to the existing Charlotte Transportation Center and the planned Charlotte Gateway Station. This was a three phase project with the first phase opening in the summer of 2015. Phase two is under construction now, and we hope to have uh, this uh, phase two open for revenue service in early 2021. The result will be a total length uh, of, uh, of phase two of four miles and 17 stops. And then we're ready to embark upon environmental design and preliminary uh, design for phase three, uh, which will connect, as I mentioned, uh, westward to uh, the Rosa Parks Place and eastward to Eastland Mall. Uh, we will begin to update the environmental document and confirm the alignment, stop locations, and a, a new location for a maintenance facility along the remaining six miles of the streetcar alignment. And with that, if there are no questions, um, Madam Mayor, I will uh, turn over to my colleague, uh, Is in the uh, Department of Transportation update. Well, I'm sorry you can't do that quite yet. There are questions, and so we've got several, but I, I do want to say that um, you're making a big case for bus rapid transit and with the reliability and the work that you're doing. So I think having an appreciation of the core of the system is so important because that's what you can move around and be responsive to. So thanks for um, that update. We've got um, three questions for you, and I'll start with Mayor Pro Tem. So I, I, you made the reference, to, Mayor, to the bus rapid transit, and John, I also, you know, am really looking forward to, we, to us to get to that place that we can have bus rapid transit. And to, um, I will not to correct you, but I had, I had hoped this, that this year was going to be the year of the bus, where we really do invest in our bus system but also invest in innovations in our bus system. I still hope that we would take advantage of this period of COVID to try some of these pilots. I think that's really critical when we have less resistance um, of congestion on our roads. So 
Um, thank you for all this hard work and for this presentation. And, Thanks. you know, if you could talk about that, John, a little bit, will we have the opportunity to get a, a BRT pilot anytime soon? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, like you, I had hoped this year would have been the year of the bus as we continue to uh, implement the uh, components of Envision My Ride. But as I mentioned earlier, with the success of the 4th Street uh, bus only lane, we're working very closely with CDOT uh, to ensure that as we embark upon a potential new pilot, that we do so in, in corridors that uh, while may seem like it will work during this downturn uh, in commuting uh, habits and changing commuting patterns, uh, once the, uh, the new normal happens, we wouldn't want to implement something that works today and cripples um, uh, CDOT's endeavors to uh, provide their service into the future. Therefore, we're working uh, in conjunction on a study uh, to move forward as quickly as we can with a pilot program uh, that will meet both of those goals. Uh, in, again, pilot bus only lanes, look for opportunities to uh, pilot advanced technology, but also on, on those corridors that make both sense from both a transit and a roadway sense. So do, do you have a sense of timing for that? Because we, we have been talking about that for a bit. And I, I just don't know that I have a sense of how um, far we are along in the opportunity to try a pilot. And and just to understand what you're saying about changing patterns during COVID, but we might be able to take that opportunity to learn a few things too, if we do run a uh, um, a pilot. So do you, is there, can you give us some timing as to when we might be able to do that? Uh, at this point, we don't have enough information for me to uh, guess on a time, um, but I, I understand the urgency uh, from council and we will certainly move forward as quickly as possible. And we'll make sure we come back potentially to the TAP committee and, and give uh, uh, frequent updates on the progress of that study. Okay, I will, I will ask about a TAP because I really would like to get an idea of when we could start a pilot, so thank you. Mr. Eggleston. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, John, this, this project is going to be the death of our friendship. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we feel lot, for you, Mr. Eggleston. I think I know where you're going. <laughs> or not. And, I, and I'm not, and I'm not pointing at you. Um, frankly, I'm pointing at the contractor. But I also think that we as a city, and I'm not putting this at John's feet, it's at all of our feet, we've got to do a better job of holding the people that we hire, that we contract, that we hire to do work for us accountable. Uh, the level of incompetence on this project is breathtaking. Um, and maybe it's just in one part of this project, but it's in a part of this project that I'm very familiar with because I live near it. And I have a lot of constituents to live right around it. And this has been hell for them for the last three plus years. Um, and as everybody's well aware by now, we, we found out there's additional delays on the Hawthorne Bridge, a project that will literally never end. And while I am glad that we're gonna be able to get it open to bike and pet access at the end of this month, theoretically, um, there are further delays to vehicle traffic crossing it. Um, it has been stated that it likely will not delay revenue service on the streetcar itself, uh, which is good news. However, I think the people living right around that bridge in particular, really all along the line, um, I was just on the west side of phase two last week, and those roads are torn up the same way the roads in my district are torn up. I know people are sick of it. They're sick of um, having a mess out in their front yard, a mess in their neighborhood, uh, streets that are torn up. Sometimes there's not someone out there with a sign telling people when they can go and when to stop uh, to make sure the traffic is, is proceeding safely. I've really gotten to the point where a couple of things. One, um, it, we have to decide where we draw a line in the sand if a contractor can't deliver on what we have asked and what they have promised. Uh, I can't imagine in the private sector 
that someone would have been allowed to continue down this path for this long and make mistakes, the magnitude of the mistakes that have been made here. Um, we got to figure out where that line in the sand is. And second, this is really to Mr. Jones, I think we need to sooner than later start having the conversation about phase three of the gold line, and is that something that we want to uh, continue to move towards? Because as big a proponent as I am for mass transit, and if we had a magic wand and we could just have this whole line uh, up and running tomorrow, I think it'd be an, an, an incredible um, an incredible piece of infrastructure for our city that would yield a ton of economic development, a ton of connectivity, uh, and a lot of things that I think everyone on this council wants for our city, but we don't have a magic wand. And we see the damage that these projects can do, and it's different from light rail. Light rail is its own um, kind of designated right away. It's not necessarily in the street, though it certainly has impacts. This is tearing up our streets, and it's also tearing up our communities. It's tearing up people's um, houses. It's tearing up businesses, figuratively speaking and literally speaking. There are businesses like Sabor and Hawthorne's Pizza who half their customers that would normally come to them can't get there and don't, don't bother trying. And we've been asking them to put up with that for years. And so what I imagine, and I, I, don't, I don't speak for Mr. Graham, but there are businesses along the Beatty's Third Poor Road Corridor that I would imagine might have the same concerns I have for the ones along Central Avenue. And a lot of those are our minority-owned businesses. A lot of those are small uh, businesses that if they close because of construction that goes on during a potential phase three of the streetcar, they'll never reopen. They'll be replaced with chains. They'll be replaced with businesses that aren't immigrant-owned, um, that don't make our city more unique uh, and more special. And I, I just can't. I'm more and more I'm having trouble wrapping my head around this project um, and, and where we draw the line, both with the contractor on phase two and with whether or not this is the best way to deploy our dollars on phase three. Uh, I am wholeheartedly in favor of us increasing our, our transit here. I am, um, as is the mayor, Pro Tim, a huge fan of testing some of the bus rapid transit options we have, a uh, huge fan of the Silver Line uh, light rail, but this streetcar has just been a pain in the ass for too long, and people are sick of it, and I'm sick of it. And we better figure something out quick, or a lot of people are going to be getting off, getting off this train, figuratively speaking, when we start talking about phase three. Thank you, Mr. Eggleston. Thank you, Mr. Eggleston. Your observations are um, on point, and the questions that we have to ask about our communities and neighborhoods are really very important. Could I address? Um, Mr. Jones would like to address some of the questions that you have. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Eggleston, uh, on your first point, uh, the city attorney and I are working on a confidential memo for all members of council that we'll get to you tomorrow about what our options are with um, where we are right now on phase two. And in terms of, of phase three, you do raise the, the, the right questions. If we start to think about this, there's a, an eastern part of this, there's a western part of it. We've talked about issues such as bus rapid transit. Um, as uh, Taiwo and John go into getting up to 30% design for phase two, excuse me, phase three, both the eastern side and the western side, all of those options will be a part of it, and I think that's a part of the analysis. But I just wanted to let you know that the memo is coming tomorrow in terms of phase two, and we will factor in the questions that you have brought up as we explore, and I use the word explore, uh, moving forward with phase three. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I think all of us are looking forward to hearing what you can say about this project and its contractor. Um, I have Ms. Watlington next. Um, so firstly, John, I like your suit. That gray looks good on me. <laughs> uh, the second thing is, and I think maybe it will be addressed in the uh, manager's memo, because I'm interested in what the terms and conditions typically are for these kind of procurement contracts, because to Councilmember Eggleston's point, I, I'm surprised that it has gone on this long, but I think that that'll probably be addressed there, so I'll hold off. Um, on that. Uh, I've got a couple more questions. The first one then in regards to Mr. Lewis in particular is what drove the ability to enhance service in the corridors? Mm -hmm. I just want to understand what factors had to be true for us to be able to enhance the uh, service at this point in time. 
Great question, uh, Councilwoman Watlington. So as we went through the impacts of the health pandemic and the impacts of the change in employment habits, in business uh, openings, and how people uh, went to work or uh, uh, changed their mobility patterns, there was, as I mentioned earlier, typically cats would employ a larger number of vehicles Actually, the number is just under 250 uh, vehicles in the winter before uh, uh, the COVID-19 during our morning and evening peaks. And I generally think about those peaks as, you know, roughly 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. and then again from about 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. And so we did that in order to meet the normal commuting patterns of people going to and from work. Once the health pandemic hit, we did not, we no longer needed that number of vehicles on the street to meet the demand for transit services. So what we were able to do is essentially reshuffle uh, the decks on the on the chair of the ship, on uh, the chair on the deck of the ship. So in corridors where we were not moving large numbers of people into uptown going to work, we were able to move some of that service those vehicles and operators to those priority corridors um, that were serving hospitals, uh, large employment centers, grocery stores, et cetera. That was our pandemic plan. And so we were able to do that in, an, in a pretty close to revenue neutral model by uh, taking service from corridors that had lower demand and move it to corridors that had higher demand and essentially increase frequencies to 15 minutes or greater. In some of those corridors, we're at 10 minute frequency. So in thinking about Mr. Winston's point, I guess I'll just um, echo that, is I'll be very interested to see how, as hopefully we return to some level of normalcy um, in the next year, how that plan is built out to maybe sustain some of those gains. But that was very innovative, so thank you for that. Um, the next question that I have is funding. So I know that we're still early on on the silver line in particular doing 30% design work, um, but how are we currently thinking about funding some of these uh, uh, rapid transit investments? Have we learned anything new or what is the, what is the current thinking? So let me uh, address the silver line. The silver line study uh, was, was planned and procured uh, with cat sales tax money and it was estimated around $50 million. That uh, budget and that uh, process is ongoing and the funds for that have already been set aside. But to your point, um, our planning staff is working day and night, looking not only on how we provide service today, but what does the transit system of the future look like mm -hmm. and what will be the demand uh, for those mobility options. And so we're trying to create a system that is, uh, number one, provides a level of frequency and service on those corridors that are needed, but also has the flexibility to uh, provide other options such as uh, mobility on demand, uh, potentially using private sector partners um, that will only uh, provide mobility connections when demanded by a, a rider, rather than the system we use, we just run vehicles and trains up along, up and down a corridor all day. Um, also, there's a potential for uh, other connections, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, partnering with uh, the transportation networking companies, the Ubers and Lyfts. And so what we want to do is make sure that in those areas where we know that we can provide the most efficient and effective service, our rail and our high capacity bus corridors that we continue to do so, but have a system that is open and flexible enough to bring in other partners to meet other uh, needs as the uh, mobility environment continues to evolve. Gotcha. And then the last thing, you don't have to answer now because I believe we'll, uh, you, Brent, and I will have a deep dive about this in the next couple of months, but just wanted to lift up the airport or piece, one of the things that um, was lifted up when I was there this month was our small business owners and how public transit, as we all know, is an enabler to economic mobility for folks who are working over at the airport. So um, look forward to getting together to talk a little bit more about how we uh, can continue to support folks working at the airport who may not have transit. Thank you. 
Ms. Watlington, I, I'd like to add that um, Taiwa has been working with our mobility task force that was created after, after we had our retreat. And we said, can we, what kind of leap can we take to actually make this happen? And so um, Harvey Gann has led a group of 24 citizens in talking about our plans and how they're financed. And um, they're making some good progress in what uh, is uh, what are the opportunities, and hopefully we'll hear back from them before the end of the year. I hope I said that well enough for Ty that he doesn't have to come back up to this podium. Um, so after uh, Ms. Watlington, uh, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. John, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, just for clarification, so the, uh, I guess the future line going from French Street to Rosa Parks, and then going from Sunnyside Avenue to Eastland, are those a part of the phase three discussion? That's correct, Councilman. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I think as we try to collaborate, those are both corridors of opportunity for us on the ED, and I think Mayor Pro Tim and I need to be joined hand in hand as we're talking about how transportation can support uh, work, uh, economic development. I know both Councilman Graham and Councilman Newton have been passionate about uh, make sure we spend those $24.5 million wisely in those corridors, but having transportation strategy will be important as well. Understood. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Mr. Winston. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I just have one comment, something that I, I uh, said in our last transportation and planning meeting um, as we were talking about our mobility plan um, and given uh, the mayor's um, apology that was delivered on behalf of the city of Charlotte, I, I, I just would like my colleagues to recognize uh, that the silver line as well as the gold line uh, runs through um, many, uh, um, many of the most affected areas uh, by the city of Charlotte's urban renewal policy. Uh, as we deal uh, with uh, this idea of, of restorative justice and giving reparations uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, the people of Charlotte, particularly black people of Charlotte, uh, who our policies have, have left out of, of, of the picture in terms of economic mobility, I would encourage my colleagues to guide staff uh, uh, to provide uh, a restorative um, policy um, options as, as we continue to develop this land, um, uh, policies that uh, will, uh, in fact, uh, 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 give, promote black home ownership and black business ownership. Um, we cannot wait for the market uh, to, to figure this out. Uh, this is our duty and our responsibility uh, to our citizens. Um, this is also the, we, this is all, these development pro uh, projects also represent uh, really the largest swaths of land that uh, we will be able to mandate um, and, and, and do what uh, we want, obviously, within regulations and, and um, um, funding, funding models uh, that, that we have to go into. Uh, but this is going to be our opportunity. Not only are these neighborhoods the most affected, uh, this is the land uh, that has the greatest potential of providing generational wealth over the next few decades um, as these transportation um, uh, investments are made. Uh, we talk about it all the time uh, outside of, uh, uh, around the blue line, um, around both phases. So again, um, my comment is to my colleagues. Um, I believe that we should be guiding staff uh, to, to come up with uh, restorative policies around our transportation um, and transit um, development uh, that provide reparations uh, for black home ownership um, and black business ownership. Thank you. Mr. Driggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Lewis, as, as one who has um, been skeptical or critical about the gold line for the last five or six years, uh, I just want to tell you I really appreciate your reference to deck chairs, which in most people's minds has a connotation of Titanic about it. Um, but I do have a question as well, and that is when we talk about the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, and we end up in a situation like this, I think with hindsight, we can raise the question as to whether the bidder that we awarded this to was in fact responsible. And I'm wondering if we need new criteria for choosing bidders in these situations so that we don't end up going with the lowest price and some kind of acceptable 
story around uh, responsible. I mean, do we look at track record? Uh, do we, uh, is there anything we could have done to identify the difficulties we're experiencing right now with this contractor, which has gone on for years? Councilman, I, I think you've brought up the million dollar question in regards to infrastructure uh, uh, procurement and, and particularly in regards to construction. When it works well, uh, it works very well. But when you find uh, situations and projects where contractors uh, and uh, project sponsors get into this never ending cycle of claim and counterclaim, uh, you, you begin to question of uh, the process by which we choose contractors. Um, some of your questions, I think, are a little beyond uh, my scope. I'm gonna turn to Phil Rieger, um, our Director of General Services, and see if he can provide uh, a better answer for you. Thank you, John. Um, just just a little, uh, let me just add a little bit to that, because um, I, I won't uh, speak for um, being somewhat new to the project, I won't speak for uh, the, the exact credentials of, of this particular contractor, but what we do know through the um, process of bidding, which was done back in 2016, um, all the contractors that bid on this had to be pre-qualified by NCDOT. So this, this contractor was, and therefore eligible to bid. I would just mention, Mr. Rieger, you know that our internal audit on contracting has highlighted, uh, going back a number of years, various difficulties we've experienced. So I hope we can use this occasion as a sort of case study in why well-intentioned plans go awry. And to me, it has to do in part with uh, looking harder at the process through which we select these contractors and the agreements we put in place in order to hold them accountable. But uh, thank you for your remarks. Thank you. All right, Mr. Graham. Well, Mayor, uh, I just want to echo some of the comments made by my colleagues in reference to the, the corridor and the importance of um, transportation options like uh, the streetcar. Uh, obviously, on the lower end of Baysville Road, we are uh, excited about the opportunities that will present once it's open. Uh, and I'm a firm believer that if we can revitalize the corridors, we can revitalize the neighborhoods around it. So I look forward to uh, continuing conversation with the council and transportation about how we could utilize transportation uh, as a vehicle for corridor enhancement and neighborhood improvement. Uh, I think council member Winston uh, makes a number of good points as well. Uh, as, as we can use as a tool for economic development. Uh, and I also concur with Council Member Mitchell on his point in terms of uh, revitalization of the corridor using transit as a, as a method and a means of doing so. So I just want to add my voice to the record. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, this discussion um, continues with CDOT and um, what we're doing around how we work our streets as well. And um, I want to say this is really important for us to begin to think about these um, tenants all working together. And so um, who's up next? Please. Ms. Babson? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I'm Liz Babson. I'm your transportation director. And this evening I'm going to give you two real quick updates on state funding allocations that we receive to maintain our streets. Next slide, please. Each year, the North Carolina General Assembly approves annual funding to maintain streets in cities and towns across the state, and we call this Powell Bill funds. These funds are primarily used in Charlotte for resurfacing efforts, but we also use those funds for other maintenance and repair activities on our city streets. Next slide, please. COVID-19, as many of us are aware, has had a drastic impact on funding at all levels of government, and we're seeing that at our state transportation funding level as well. You may be familiar with recent state legislature that um, approved HB 777, which was the NCDOT funding bill for FY 2021, and that made some budget reductions to impact our Powell Bill funding. Specific adjustments to our Powell Bill funding include a one-time 10% reduction for FY 21 to Powell Bill across the entire state, but more specifically to Charlotte and Raleigh 
we had a one third one time reduction for municipalities with a population of over 400. That reduction in Powellville is approximately $8.2 million to our typical annual Powellville allocation, making our new estimated amount for FY21 $12.3 million. Next slide, please. But we've got this covered, and so we've worked very closely with our budget office. We've reviewed internal operations, made some budget adjustments and operational changes for one year to solve for all but $3.4 million of that reduction in power bill allocation. That will result in us reducing our contracted resurfacing budget by this year that will reduce the amount that we typically resurface by about 25%. We believe we can sustain this one-time budget impact without any significant impact to maintaining our infrastructure over the long haul. Next slide, please. And I've got some good news on another state funding allocation that I'd like to share with you. NCDOT has a statewide asset maintenance program where they reimburse cities for maintenance of traffic control assets on state streets within those city limits. This covers installation, operations, and maintenance for things like traffic signals, traffic signs, and pavement markings. The city of Charlotte has actually entered into agreements with NCDOT like this for more than 25 years, and there are about 15 cities across the state that enter into agreements similar to this. And I'm happy to say that you approved um, at your last business meeting on July 27th a new funding agreement with NCDOT in the amount of $1,175,000, and there has been no reduction in funding for this effort. And with that, I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you. Any questions? Huh. All right, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Liz, for that presentation and the work that you do with C, that you and CDOT do. I have a question regarding the, um, the reimbursement from NCDOT. Here in District 4, we have some, some, some of our major thoroughfares that are state owned, and we get a lot of requests from residents regarding the, uh, the maintenance or the, the litter or the, the grass, and, and so many times it's it, there's state-owned roads, roads such as uh, 49 and W.T. Harris. Will this reimbursement allow the city to um, uh, to to do work on those thoroughfares and receive reimbursement? Yes, ma'am, but not for the two examples that you just men mentioned. So this agreement is specific to traffic control devices, and again, those are things like traffic signals, traffic signs, and pavement markings. Um, so things like litter and the maintenance of the asphalt are not covered under this agreement. So uh, thank you. So is there an option for, because um, and many times I've reached out and the city staff has, has cleaned it up as a courtesy and I appreciate that. But moving forward, we know that there was a budget cut, I think with, with NCDOT that's affecting um, the maintenance of these areas. Is, do we have options? To maintain the grass and the trash in in our district, um, if NCDOT is not able to maintain. Yes, ma'am. I believe our two options would be the city either covers the cost of that maintenance on the state street, or we would enter into an agreement with the state. But again, as you mentioned, NCDOT has had some funding implications and would not likely enter into any new agreements for arrangements like that. Well, thank you. Thank you for the work that CDOT is doing, Liz. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Liz, uh, I kind of want to follow Councilman Johnson because I think we talk about corridors opportunity. We have heard some of the residents that uh, the, uh, the exits or the ramps uh, is not pleasing to some of the citizens that we know they're owned by the state. And so it's in a way we can get creative though and come up with a solution. I, I think our residents are tired of hearing it's the state and nothing's being done. So, um, and I don't know, city manager, can we put this part of our corridors of opportunity, maybe focus on those six as a pilot. But I, I do think 
when you're talking about rebranding and, and putting our money to corridors, one thing is very important is a, a beautification. And so don't need an answer now, but I'll, if we could get creative and how to address that, I think uh, it'll make a lot of the council members happy. Sounds good. We'll share with you, Council Member Mitchell. I did just receive an update from the division engineer, and they are proceeding landscaping and clearing um, many of those areas. So we should see some improvements in that regard in the coming months. Liz, you mean he's watching you right now and responding to you by text? No, no ma'am. He actually came <laughs> last week. Okay. I was going to be a little bit worried. Okay. Um, Ms. Watlington? Sure. So I've got just a couple. Um, Liz, can you put, first of all, thank you all for being proactive and anticipating and making sure that we were able to cover, um, even with the cow bill reductions. Uh, I just want to make sure I have my mind wrapped around it. Can you recap for me what what our net difference is? And the reason I ask is because I've got that $14.5 million in my head, and I'm thinking about some of the work that is going on down in Still Creek, and I just want to make sure I understand the impacts of the reductions on that. $3.4 million is the final impact to our um, total Powell bill allocation after we've made some adjustments internally and we are going to reduce our contracted resurfacing amount by that much, which is about 25%. Okay. And that is separate from the signalization and other improvements um, that we've targeted certain areas of the city for? Yes, ma'am. Um, and then the next thing, from a TDM standpoint, and I know we're still early in our journey there, um, but I'm curious to know if there are local businesses who may be interested in making those investments to enable their employees to get uh, to get to work during rush hour a little bit better. I'm wondering if, if we've had any conversations with anybody about potentially making those investments and then being reimbursed um, on the back end by the state or what the conversation is in that space for private partnerships, public private partnerships. Um. So let me answer that question a couple of different ways. So the, the Powell Bill allocation is to resurface city streets, not state streets. And I know many of the ones in your district um, are in CDOT maintained. So I don't know if that changes your question or not. Um, but also, I mean, we're always interested in partnering with developers, property owners to make improvements to the city's asset and NCDOT would, would likely engage in that as well. Okay. Um, well, so because you said what you said, let me ask you this. If it is a state road, what would then the avenue be? Say if BASF came and said, you know what, I think if we just went ahead and improved this turn signal at the intersection, that we would see an improvement in our employees being able to get to work on time or anything like that. What is the avenue by which they could do that now or does one exist? Um, if it were being funded by a private entity, we would enter into an encroachment agreement with NCDOT to have them perform that work within the right of way. Okay. Um, and then the only other thing that I was going to ask is about the um, the litter and the maintenance of some of the state highways. I get the same kinds of constituent concerns. And I'm just curious where the adopt the highway program plays a role in that, or if there are opportunities for um, neighborhoods to come out and clean up. Because I know that on the west side, we do a lot of like underpass cleanups and things like that. It counts towards our volunteer hours for matching grant. I'm just curious how we leverage that program or if it if it's a fit for this kind of thing it absolutely could be a fit for that um the city and the state both have those programs obviously you wouldn't do that on a freeway or an interstate for example where you've got high travel speeds and, and nowhere safe for people to do that litter collection but the city and the state both have that program currently and how do we we just somebody could just email us and i'll forward it i guess <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. All right. I don't have anyone else for questions, so. Um, I do. I have a question, Mayor. I'm sorry. Who is that? Ashmira. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, most of my questions have been addressed. Um, uh, I do have another question that wasn't addressed around uh, truck parking. I know we were getting complaints. Uh, the last complaint we had received was late last year about trucks parking at the entrance of um, uh, at, at the entrance of uh, freeways, especially off of Sugar Creek, uh, WT Harris and so on. And I know that staff was working with NCDOT on that, um, where we had seen where, where there were signs that were put out. Uh, however, uh, we had seen that problem uh, occur somewhere else after signs were put out at one exit. So was that issue addressed or any update you can provide on that? Yes, ma'am, we work closely with NCDOT um, and Highway Patrol to install new signs on those two exit ramps. I believe it was Graham Street and Statesville Avenue in particular, where there was previous signing that had been knocked down and removed. And so those signs have been reinstalled. Thank you. All right, Mr. Jones. Thank, thank you, Mayor, members of council. And we have a couple of uh, guests tonight, so I appreciate their, their patience. Uh, and that is our health director, Gibby Harris, as well as uh, Dr. Rungi, who will talk a bit about uh, safety and preparation for the RNC, as well as uh, there are several members of CMPD who have been working on uh, the RNC as well as the DNC back in 2012. So Angela, I don't know if you wanted to tee it off or, or Gibby or or what's next. I know you're in, in the next room, but um, this is in response to council asking for an, an update around safety for the RNC. All right, so um, we'll have introductions and have them come up. So Ms. Harris, Ms. Charles, and Dr. Runge. Runge. Thank Rungi. you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Rungi. I have a RG. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for telling me that. I should probably know that. I think you're famous about this stuff. <laughs> um, good evening. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to give you all an update on where we are with the planning. Um, and um, I'm going to make a few quick comments and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rungi to run through the presentation and then we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, or attempt to. Anyway, um, my name is Gibby Harris. I am the health director here in Mecklenburg County um, and have had the benefit of working with a, a really um, a good group of people um, on, on the RNC. You know, our, our focus has been uh, to make this reduced convention as safe as it possibly can be, both for our community as well as the delegates and attendees. Um, we continue to plan with the state and with our national partners. Um, we're, we're planning around lots of different things, obviously. Some of the planning has been going on for almost two years now, and some of it has been a little more uh, recent. Um, I do want to uh, let you know that I've been in um, fairly constant comment conversation with the state health director around this to make sure that whatever we're putting together um, will be acceptable to the state based on the governor's latest executive order. And um, in the last letter from Betsy Tilson, state health director, uh, basically what she's saying is that um, in order to be supportive of this event, we are going to have to make some accommodations um, but based on the unique interests and needs of the convention, um, we're willing uh, to be somewhat flexible in enforcement um, with certain public health measures. So you'll see that as um, Dr. Rungi goes through this, um, this presentation. Uh, Dr. Rungi is a senior health and medical advisor that is working with the RNC, and he has been working with a group of us here in the county. He's been driving this effort um, very effectively, and so I am going to turn it over to him, who obviously is virtual, 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 uh, county government building, um, to go through this presentation. 
So Jeff, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, Gibby, thank you very much. Is my audio okay for the council? Yes, we're hearing you well. Yes, you're good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be uh, appearing before you, even though I'm about an hour and a half away. Um, uh, I have a, a very short slide deck. It's like seven slides, and, I, and I'd like to get to the point where we can um, field questions uh, if, if possible. Um, and I don't know if I have control of these slides or not, so um, somebody who is more adept would have to help me out. If I just say next slide, maybe magic will happen. Yes, that's what uh, the magic will happen. What's going okay, to so, so if you can go to the previous slide, <laughs> thank you. So um, this this plan um, uh, follows a uh, a form that I learned when I was Assistant Secretary of Health Affairs at Homeland Security uh, back when I was exiled from Charlotte to D.C. in the 2000 and aughts. Um, it follows the National Response Framework, which. Um, uh, has the principles of, of prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery that we use for basically any event or any any disaster. Uh, we're using it in this case to prevent the consequences of the disaster that we already find ourselves in. Um, and one of the first principles in the National Response Framework is that when you are working with something that has occurred or you're trying to prevent occurring in a local community, the first thing you do is to engage the, the local community. Um, and the, in, in this case, uh, all of the necessary uh, assets that we need to carry on a, a successful and, uh, and healthy meeting exist in Charlotte and Mecklenburg County and the surrounding areas. Um, I'm very happy that this has been scaled down. Uh, this actually gets us to a, a, a condition that we can control um, and uh, as you can see here, the, we, we formed a planning cell back in early May that includes not only myself and our director of operations, but Charlotte Emergency Management, uh, the health department in, in the form of Gibby Harris. Both Atrium Health and Novant Health have had uh, robust presences uh, in, the, in the meetings, which happen uh, two or three times a week, as well as Mecklenburg County EMS. Um, this committee actually has to um, be in sort of conjoined um, effort uh, and reporting to, in some ways, to the uh, Health and Medical Subcommittee of the Executive Committee of the National Special Security Event, which is coordinated by the Secret Service. Um, I believe the concept of a NSSE is familiar to you. Um, there are certain events uh, that the federal government uh, uh, proclaims to be national special security events. And what that does is it, 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 it names the principal federal official as the Secret Service and makes resources available to augment what is needed at the local level. There certainly would have been plenty needed had, uh, had we not been in the pandemic and would have had, you know, from 20 to 50,000 people in town. Uh, if I could have the next slide. Um, so, uh, those of you who are military veterans will recognize, um, you know, planning doctrine, which is really just the principles of, around which we build a plan. Um, and these are the five core ones, and that is, is that this plan uh, and our implementation of the plan will comply with state and local health directives. Um, and we, um, as Gibby said, we've been working uh, with her. Uh, Dr. Betsy Tilson is the state health director. She is actually sits on the COVID subcommittee of that health and medical subcommittee that I talked about. Uh, so we've had uh, full transparency the entire way, and it really is the only way to, to do things. Um, this gathering, uh, if you use the Johns Hopkins um, uh, stratification of risk, it, this is a high risk event. Again, it doesn't compare to the, to the risk that would have taken place had we had, you know, 50,000 people here. But it is still a high-risk event. People are coming in from every state in the country and from some from those of the six territories that are allowed to travel. Um, and so we, this is a serious issue. Uh, and the way we mitigate that is to put in multiple layers of risk reduction that can bring that risk level down into the acceptable range. It will not be risk-free, and so you'll see that we're jumping through some significant hoops in order to 
uh, carry on a meeting where that is COVID negative and that provides no risk to the community, um, uh, which is frankly the third principle here. And that is, is that uh, I was brought on board uh, by, the, by the Republican Convention Committee uh, with one mission, and that is to help them have a safe meeting. Um, I mentioned the, the core capabilities uh, before of health protection, prevention, mitigation, and response and recovery. And uh, the implementation of this plan depends upon many um, elements of the community supported by uh, principally the federal government as well as the private sector. So if I could have the next slide. So um, that's, that's basically the planning doctrine and the principles. Um, uh, this is the third major uh, uh, attribute of this plan, and that is, is that this is not a political plan. We, I have been totally unresponsive to uh, 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 anything that, that uh, sounds political, um, and uh, and we, you know it, it's easy to do that because of the planning cell that we have, which are people from Charlotte. They're physicians. They are paramedics. They are uh, health administrators. Uh, and uh, they understand that if this thing uh, that is not carried on in a safe manner, that they are at the tip of the spear. Uh, and those health systems will be the ones that will suffer, as well as the, the poor uh, uh, county health department that's going to be stuck with, with uh, uh, tracing of contacts and so forth. So um, we are observing guidelines that are put out by the CDC, uh, the White House Task Force, uh, the, st the state of North Carolina, uh, the county of Mecklenburg, and with the wisdom of some really smart people, senior physicians uh, and administrators within the two health systems. And those, those elements are uh, communication, communication, and communication uh, with the participating attendees uh, to let them know that this is not the same kind of convention they have attended in prior years. This is about the business of nominating a candidate for president. And this typically happens in other years, the week before the convention. Then the convention meets, and it's what's on TV that we all, you know, we all like to watch. Um, you know, it's the, it's the big pep rally, and that's not this. This is the business of the convention. And our feedback from Dr. Tilson at the state is, is that the flexibility uh, of our being able to bring together uh, 336 delegates and another, uh, you know, 75 to 100. Um, uh, support people from out of town, um, it depends upon their respect for the democratic process of doing this and that the, the important part is the business of the convention and it's not a party. Um, so this, so what we're going to do is every person who travels to Charlotte uh, who's an official attendee of this convention is going to be given an at-home test. Um, it's a, it's a one that it's the only one uh, that is both uh, preliminary chain reaction based um, and has an internal control to make sure that the sample is adequate. Um, it's a North Carolina company, um, and we have high confidence that a negative is a negative and a positive is positive. So that's the, the first hurdle. We do not want anybody who is COVID positive to get on an airplane or to go to an airport or to land in Charlotte and expose the Uber or Lyft drivers or, or whoever um, on the way to the hotel. They will, they will be invited to stay at home and other accommodations will be made for representation for their state. Um, when they arrive, they will be tested again. Now, the at-home test will occur seven days before they travel, uh, and that will occur seven days after they have been observing enhanced social distancing, so they should not have had any contact with a COVID-positive person in the, in the days prior to the test nor should they have any uh, contacts with COVID-positive persons after the test. Um, but, uh, you know, if for some reason someone does um, enter a gathering, uh, my burglar alarm went off the other day. I'm sorry, my fire alarm went off, and, you know, three volunteer firemen showed up at my front door with no masks on. I, I couldn't control that. Uh, so stuff happens. Um, so we're going to test them again when they get here. They will start arriving on Wednesday. We will be doing testing Thursday and Friday and Saturday as people arrive. And we are going to have a COVID negative attendee cohort coming from every state in the country and some of the territories. 
Um, the community support staff that are members of this community, who some are, of whom are in high risk groups, some are, are in low prevalence groups, but they're all gonna be tested if they are front of house staff and in contact with, with the cohort, the 50 state cohort. Um, every day, the attendees will be um, will have to attest to a history or signs and symptoms of COVID uh, for risk of transmission. And we'll have people who are trained in physical observation to look for anybody who just doesn't look good. They will be referred to a secondary screening area that is staffed by health professionals from both Novon and Atrium. Um, and we're not gonna let anybody in the meeting who appears to be ill. Uh, there's gonna be 100% uh, compliance with physical distancing. The chairs do not move in the meeting rooms. Um, the meeting room configuration is configured to be six feet apart, both that way and that way. Uh, and there's gonna be 100% mask use in indoor spaces and anywhere, including outdoor spaces when close contact cannot be avoided. Um, in addition, we're also concerned about the risk of this cohort because uh, a good portion of these people uh, are in uh, high risk groups due to age only. Others are in, in, in vulnerable risk groups due to their medical conditions and they love to travel and they love this stuff and they're gonna be here. So we need to, we will know who they are and we will know uh, our, our health teams will be alert to how many of those people are, are, are here. Uh, and we will be alert to working you know, closely with them to make sure that they remain healthy. We're also employing a technology that uh, we learned about that um, is a, what we call uh, a, um, a safety fob, part of the badge, um, and it's Bluetooth enabled, and it knows when other badges are close to it. Uh, and how long they are close to it. And uh, the, the identity of who's wearing that badge is, is known, you know, the, the PII is protected, it's in a database and nobody will ever crack that code unless somebody gets sick. Uh, and we will find out if they're sick because we're gonna follow them up when they leave Charlotte at day five, day 14 and day 21 with emails, text messages and phone calls in order to detect if anybody has gotten sick, whether it's here or there, uh, and then we will be able to tell the people who were in close contact with that individual and with the help of, of, of Gibby's people um, and the state, uh, we will be able to uh, make um, contact tracing uh, automated and exceedingly simple for, for our contact tracers here, not to add to their, their uh, burden of already uh, very, very, very difficult task. Um, next slide, please. So just in terms of the categories of, of things that we do, um, you know, for prevention and protection, once again, uh, attendees will attest to, the, to their risk factors and their health limitations. Um, uh, they will, we will have that discussion with them. They will have daily symptom checks, temperature checks. And, and every day it, when they, with the, if they pass a symptom check and the, and the temperature check, and they've just had a negative COVID test a day or two or three before, they'll be given a wristband and the color of the day that will allow them to, uh, to enter the meeting spaces. Um, those will be monitored by our staff, uh, by a private security group um, that uh, the RNC has used in the past, um, gentle giants who will be um, making sure that people are observing social distancing and wearing their masks um, and uh, that they have the wristband for the day before they go in. Uh, there will be, there will be, these meetings will be in, in the, both the meeting hotel and then on Monday uh, when the national special security event occurs, that will occur in the convention center. Um, the Secret Service will be manning the security for the, the convention center, but we will have our usual people doing screening, secondary screening, uh, and making sure that uh, they have their, their badge, their credential, their safety fob, uh, and their wristband for the day before they are allowed to into the into the area. Uh, and once they get into the convention center, everybody in that convention center will have had a, a COVID test uh, within uh, the, the previous few days. Um, and if there's any symptoms uh, of anybody, that will be noticed on the way in with our screeners. They will not be allowed to come into the space uh, uh, for any of those meeting meeting days in which they are ill and medical care will be available to them, uh, both uh, on-site and through a telemedicine application that we're providing to them 
as well as their own contact with their personal physician back home. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned some of this, but what I have not mentioned is, is that, you know, food and beverage is a problem. And, and people who come to a meeting from out of town, they like to eat and like to drink. And unfortunately, that's not gonna be part of this meeting. Um, uh, so, we, but we have to feed them. Uh, and it's actually safer for them to eat in, in this, I hesitate to use the word bubble because it brings on you know, NBA connotations, but, but in fact, it is, a, it is a protected space where everybody has been tested negative and it's actually safer to feed them there uh, and that's what's going to happen for breakfast and lunch. But all of those meals will be either seated or they will, they will have a box and they will, they will be encouraged to eat breakfast in their rooms uh, or at lunchtime, uh, they'll probably be in a meeting room uh, and in their distanced seat. Um, no, uh, no other social gatherings will, will take place uh, in excess of what is in the governor's executive order, which is 10 people indoors and 25 people outdoors. And even in those cases, they will be masked and they will be encouraged to physically distance themselves. Um, and and the, the rest of this is just standard operating procedure for any county during the pandemic. Uh, and that is if there's a COVID positive uh, uh, individual, uh, they will have to isolate uh, until the, for 14 days. If they're symptomatic, they will follow the CDC guidelines for that, which is a, 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 a day without any symptoms um, after they're symptomatic. Uh, during, uh, if they come into contact with a, with a, a COVID positive individual, uh, they will be quarantined 14 days, again, following the directives of the Mecklenburg County Health Director. Um, the RNC staff will, will help these people be successful in isolation and in quarantine. We're not going to leave them stranded. They'll, they will eat, they will drink, they will communicate, um, uh, and they will, they will leave and go home as soon as their, their, their time is up. Um, and again, I mentioned that we're going to follow up after they leave the meeting to make sure, and, and this has really two big purposes. Number one, this has not been done before. This is, we, this is the largest sanctioned event that we know of outside of professional sports. Um, and while we're not trying to set a precedent here, um, we do want to know if it works. So uh, we're going to do an after action report, which we'll of course share with you and, and the commissioners um, and anybody else who's interested, because we think this is a, you know, I don't want to call it a, a social experiment, but, but we really are, we're, we're, you know, we're using uh, scientific evidence we are we'll be testing those hypotheses and we want to we want to report on that afterwards and the other reason as i mentioned before is that we are responsible for helping the mecklenburg county health department with their contact detection and notification so we want to make sure that we know of anybody who's attended the meeting in an official capacity who uh, might have become ill after they left last slide i think it's the last slide it should be the last slide um we talked a bit about, about mitigation and response. Again, both hospitals have been great providing medical support. Um, they, uh, the, the, the testing capabilities are, uh, we want to assure the council that this is not going to detract from, uh, from the general epidemiological testing of the community. Um, uh, Novant has acquired uh, a reagent for, their, uh, for one of their platforms that is not used for general testing. Uh, and Atrium Health is working with the state and, and frankly with the U.S. HHS to acquire some additional reagent for their machine to make sure that, that uh, uh, no testing is, is diverted or interrupted. Um, and I think last slide might be, what, um, see, if this, see if that was the last slide, please. Oh, this is the last slide. And if it's not, I'll stop. Um, just to let you know that there's a lot of people involved in this thing. The critical support functions, you know, communications and communications and communications, you know, public education, uh, public notification, setting of expectations. Um, that's all been going on now for, for a couple of weeks. Um, uh, there are vendors who will, who will be private bus operators who will be observing all of the health protocols necessary. Uh, we have been looking at ventilation and, uh, and filtering 
And it started with the Spectrum Center before all this stuff happened with Jacksonville and everything else. Uh, and we, we are, we've become very familiar with the ventilation systems in the Charlotte Convention Center uh, and in the Weston. They have upgraded their, their filtering um, for this occasion. Uh, the, the ventilation is, is state of the art. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to keep our planning cell functioning in case uh, something happens that we have not planned for. Um, uh, and so forth. So we feel really good about this. We feel really good about the, the status of the uh, emergency medical services and the emergency management in, in Charlotte, as well as the robustness of the, of the two medical centers. And frankly, you know, this was a great place to have a convention. Um, and it's of the size now that uh, it can be managed locally. So, um, I, you know, I, I'm a native Charlottean. Uh, I was exiled to, to D.C. and then to Chapel Hill for 20 years. I'm moving back home. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about, about being back, and, I'm, and, I, and it's, it's been great for me to reconnect with the community in this way, and I'm, I'm very grateful um, to the community for, for its, its community spirit. Uh, the medical center has put out a, a joint press release this morning. How often does that happen? Um, so, you know, um, we, we are, we're very excited about uh, about. Uh, where we're going here, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. Thank you. Ms. Harris? I'm going to try to get Ms. Harris back to the podium, I think. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we have Ms. Harris back and Dr. Runji is on. Um, I have a couple of folks that would like to speak or ask questions. Ms. Ajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a great presentation and the plan that we have to keep our residents and our visitors safe. Um, I, I do have a question around our essential workers that are working that will be working at hotels or in restaurants. Uh, what is the plan to keep them safe? Well, that you, uh, and, uh, before Gibby, it, it, she's the proper person to answer this question, but I will tell you that, um, first of all, uh, all those personnel, and many of them come from, from uh, uh, communities where you know, the population is very dense and they're at risk for you know, having asymptomatic uh, COVID and transmitting it. Um, and, you know, this is also a cohort coming in from 50 states, uh, but everybody's going to be tested who interacts with each other. Um, and uh, we are uh, we are doing testing um, of, uh, three and four days before people arrive. The staffs of those of the venues are being brought in for training special training, not just for this event, but also for, uh, for the sake of, of of how to do social distancing and mask wearing, and they're, they're getting additional training, uh, and, and we're going to have a testing clinic at that time to make sure that, uh, that they're all uh, COVID negative. The ones that aren't will not be, um, will not be allowed to work in, in, in front of house, and what, the, what their, their personnel, what their HR department to do is, is up to them. They'll be following uh, state and county directives about that. So. This was a really important thing to us. We wanted to make sure that, uh, and there are going to be, you know, 400 people, uh, considering you know all the, the the two venues, the the RNC staff is now local and will probably remain local. They came here a year ago to support the convention, and a lot of them like it. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, we feel pretty we feel pretty confident um, that uh, you know everybody is going to be on exactly the same basis. Uh, there's no privileged characters. Everybody's going to be um, uh, going to be expected to do their part to remain safe, and we're going to test them to make sure that, that the group is, is COVID negative. So thank you, Jeff. So would, would testing access be also provided to workers? That yes. Yes. Oh. The, the, the individuals who are working in the venues so all of the delegates and the other individuals coming out of county are being housed at the Westin. Um, and then the convention center is the other site. And folks that are working in the Westin with, the, with 
having any interaction with the candidates at all, or not candidates, I keep saying that, the delegates, um, or the others from out of town, as well as all of those that will be working in the convention center will be tested um, on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday prior to those individuals coming into town. So it was important to know that um, we were protecting the delegates and the people from coming that are coming here to make sure they were negative when they got here, um, but also those individuals that are coming in to work with them and for them during this event. So any any interaction there, and, and Dr. Rungi mentioned a bubble, um, what we're doing is trying to create an environment where we know that everybody that's in that environment is negative um, as they come in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Eggleston. Mr. Eggleston. Okay, um, Mr. Bakari. Yes, thank you. Um, so it sounds like, um, I know you didn't say like the NBA bubble, but there's obviously like a, a feel of there are a lot of very in-depth protocols to ensure safety of that. That was a good visualization. Um, I guess the, my question is, it sounds like in this type of environment, what was already a minimized impact for our struggling small businesses and hospitality workers is probably, is it a correct assumption to assume that it will go from limited to basically almost nothing at this point? Well, I will say that, um, you know, let me just say that, that the, our primary concern, my primary concern uh, is not the economic benefit of this meeting occurring in Charlotte. I'm glad that it's, it's coming and I'm glad that there will be, uh, uh, there will be uh, you know, uh, 400 people who will be supporting this meeting. Um, it's interesting that the state uh, Dr. Tilson, state health director, really did not want us to feed people um, in the evenings because of, you know, people without masks on and in, in, in large groups. And so they are going to get out and go to restaurants. Uh, the, the RNC staff is, is, you know, contacting restaurants in the area to make sure that enough of them are going to have reservations, restaurants that are adhering to the local uh, protocols. Um, there are going to be enough to feed people. Uh, both uptown and, you know, close by. Um, so, you know, I think there will be a bump, to tell you the truth, in, you know, but it's going to be n nothing like uh, would have occurred had there not been a pandemic and there had been 50,000 people coming to Charlotte. Sure. No, and, and Jeff, I completely appreciate from your perspective, you've been hired to do a specific thing and um, it seems like you are uh, you are taking that very seriously and doing it to the uh, uh, you know from my perspective to the top of the ability that it can be done. So I thank you for that. I guess that my my request would just be on the broader uh, coalition of folks working on this. You've brought in a top gun on safety and innovation around health in Jeff, and in also working with. Uh, our local uh, health leaders, uh, I would plead for you guys to also find somebody that is just the same as amount of a passionate champion for the local small businesses, for the hospitality workers uh, in creatively figuring out, um, you know, how we can have them provide, um, you know, a breakfast or a lunch or, or because these people have been looking at this for so long as potentially a life raft of economic recovery. And uh, I would really hope that um, they go and call in the big guns, whatever the Jeff equivalent is on the economic side in creativity. I, I, I plead with those folks to consider that as well. Well, uh, thank you very much. I will tell you, Mr. Bakari, that um, the staff of the RNC, uh, you know, these are um, they're young, gung-ho, uh, you know, vibrant people. They have been trying to figure out what stuff around Charlotte that the, that the uh, delegates can do when they're not in meetings that will be fun and, you know, like, you know, top golf or, you know, these sorts of venues, um, they're, they're making a list so that they'll be able to get out and do things. 
uh, in, in venues that are appropriately, you know, where, where this social distancing can actually occur. Um, so, you know, they'll find their own way. You know, these are, you know, these, these people have been to blocks of, of conventions before, and, you know, um, if they got money in their pocket, I hope they'll spend it in, in the community. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to help them. Um, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gnarly problem because, you know, this pandemic stinks for everybody. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, you know, there's nothing great about this. Everything is a compromise. Um, so, you know, our, our delegates certainly don't like uh, coming to town and not having, you know, the, the typical celebration over a presidential candidate. Um, you know, there won't be, the, you know, the, the pep rally feeling of, of that both conventions have, you know, every four years, and they don't like that. Um, and the economic benefits that come from that. So, yeah. I, you know, I don't know what else to say. That's been part of our conversation, though. It's, it's not a typical convention. It can't be right now, not for our community. And so um, we're trying to make sure that the delegates understand that, but also, as, as Jeff mentioned, in working with um, the RNC committee to identify those places nearby that can go to, have a meal, enjoy themselves, and come back. Um, we're just wanting to make sure that we don't create an environment um, during this event that um, could easily turn into a party or um, could expose a lot of people at any given time. So we're, just, we're trying to, it's a balancing act. Um, but I do believe by not having big events at the facility, it does give people more of an opportunity to get out in the community and potentially get to some of those places that you're talking about. Thank you. All right, Mr. Driggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm really impressed with the spirit of cooperation, the care, the collaboration among all the parties that is going into this planning. I can't help but wish that it had been like that the whole time, frankly. Um, it's taken us too long to get to the point where we were working together like this to deal with the reality, which was the virus was the enemy here. I mean, not the governor, not the president. We needed to be working in these terms, looking at what kind of accommodations could be made and what was necessary for health. So anyway, I'm pleased that as the time draws near, we've really got a good plan. The question I have is, um, what are we doing, and this may be for the manager as well, what are we expecting in terms of manifestations in the streets and the kind of health hazards that they could present and the other safety issues around that. So again, I realize this is not just for the medical people, but have we given thought to uh, the, the risks related to crowds in the streets? Do we, do we have assumptions about what kind of crowds we should expect? What about the outside of the convention itself? So, so Mr. Drakes, the, the second, Council Member Drakes, the second part of this presentation includes a CMPD response. All right, good. Uh, so then it's just a question, I guess, of uh, do, do we have any thoughts? I mean, we've seen in other uh, crowd manifestations that mask wear was sometimes patchy, uh, that people certainly didn't maintain distance. Uh, do we have any thoughts around that, or do we, are we planning in any way for that? What can we say about it? So I will say that we will have masks available um, for individuals that are in the street. Um, and what, what has been seen, there's been a couple of studies that have been done um, since some of the large protests, especially in Milwaukee. And what they found is that people being outside with the majority of people wearing masks, that the likelihood of transmission is much lower than we would have expected to begin with. So I think if we, if we plan ahead, make sure that we have resources available to the people in the street to him. and keep the crowds moving, um, and not blessing in one place, um, we have a much lower possibility of exposure. Thank you. Well, I, I think you're all setting a great example for how cooperation can work in managing these issues. And uh, I, I appreciate the work you've done. I'm looking forward to a healthy convention. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Winston. Yes. Uh, I have a, a practical question um, about 
airflow in room where several hundred people are going to be for hours. Um, as uh, Dr. Runty said, like this is uh, not going to be the pep rally. But this is going to be a situation where you will have delegates sitting in the same room um, for an extended period of time. I, I know, um, I, 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 I believe what you would say is that testing is your primary um, weapon uh, to, to, to making sure that there is no contamination um, within the rooms. But are we doing anything? Are we talking to the folks at the convention center, CRBA, uh, that, that we have any concerns or are doing anything um, uh, about airflow, HVAC, um, with these hundreds of people sitting in one room for an extended uh, period of time? And how are we looking at that? Yes, we are. Uh, so we went with engineering um, in, in, in both places. And uh, it's, first of all, now, the state wants us to observe a person per square footage that is currently in place for a restaurant, which is 12 people per thousand square feet. Um, and all of the engineering of the HVAC systems uh, turns over air well in excess of what would be required or even you know more than that. So it also depends on where the supplies are and where the returns are. In the convention center, a lot of that it all happens in the ceiling. So apparently, I don't really know the architecture, but everything must be up there between the, you know, over the, the second floor, um, such that, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the air that circulates is, is you know, pulled in from the top, which is, which is good. Um, you know, as I used to say to, you know, my residents, the solution to pollution is dilution. And where there are germs, if you can get that air circulating, uh, the better it is. Much of that air is recirculated, but it's running through um, a MERV 15 filtration system. So MERV 13 is um, what's considered adequate for the sorts of particulate matter uh, down to the, you know, the, the microns of, of droplets and even aerosolized um, viruses. MERV 15 is closer to hospital grade, uh, and that's what's in the system in the convention center. So. Um, we feel, you know, we feel good about that. Interestingly, the Spectrum Center, when it was still a candidate, uh, had worked on upgrading its systems. And it really depends on, you know, that it's, it's interesting, you know, it, it puts more stress on a blower, uh, the higher, the, 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 the smaller the filter, you know, the filters are in the, in the filtration system. But both facilities were fully capable of, of managing that. So, yeah, we've looked at this pretty thoroughly. It's very important. Um, but, you know, I will say again, you know, you can get away with a world of sins by wearing a mask. And if you can, if you can contain the, the droplets, if you can limit the spread of the aerosols by not cheering and shouting and singing and, you know, preaching and stuff, you know, I, I asked this question. I said, so tell me about the, you know, about the climate of the, the speakers and so forth in a typical convention. I've never been to one. And I was told, think of it more like a, a giant college lecture. In this case, where these meetings occur, think more like a giant college lecture than like uh, a rock concert um, or anything in between. So I, I feel I feel very comfortable that we're that, that the, the buildings that were selected for this venue are up to the task. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Eggleston. I step, I step away to get a pint of ice cream. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Have you finished it yet? <laughs> no, uh, even, even Colbert, in the spirit of uh, political discussion, Mary Kent Green is delicious. Um, the doctor answered one of my questions, which was just more specifically around the number of, I mean, we knew the number of delegates, but the kind of total number of people, including support staff and others, because obviously it takes more than just delegates to put on a convention. Um, so you answered that earlier. But uh, I'm actually a delegate to next week's convention, which is entirely virtual um, now with not even the speakers going to Milwaukee uh, to broadcast from there, but staying at their home uh, states and, and cities to broadcast. One of the communications that we have received loud and clear as delegates to the DNC I'm curious whether Republicans have received the same thing is anticipating that, uh, as you said, these are enthusiastic uh, party supporters who want to be at these conventions and are highly disappointed that they're not taking place as normal. 
anticipating that folks might show up in Milwaukee uh, despite being told that they weren't supposed to, they have been very clear communications coming from the DNC to us delegates saying, do not come to Milwaukee, and if you do, there will be nothing for you to come to. Um, and this was even prior to it being entirely virtual. Have there been communications that have gone out to the delegates or to others who might have wanted to come if they're not one of those 300 and some delegates that are going to be in person that says, if you come here, you will not be allowed to attend anything. Uh, so please don't show up in Charlotte expecting that you can, you know, meet up with a buddy and get into something that you weren't invited to. Uh, that's a great question, and I, I don't know the answer. I, you know, the communications around health have been focused on the people who will be here, um, both delegates, um, non-delegate committee members. Um, there are, uh, you know, um, Gibby's going to have, you know, 20 people who are in her environmental health crowd. There's going to be firemen and police officers and, and so forth. We've been really focused on communicating expectations for um, uh, behavior and uh, what's expected for those that are coming. I actually, I can't answer the question, but I'll get back to you on that. That's a good, good question. I know. Mayor, Mayor, I could comment on that. Well, well I, can, I think that we need to get, Mr. Eggleston was saying something first. Mr. Yeah. Eggleston? Yeah, I know Mr. Driggs is involved in that, so I'd be curious to hear. If, if it hasn't, and I'm done after that, so Mr. Driggs can answer that. If it hasn't been sent out, I think it'd be useful because there will be people who think, well, I can show up and still get into some events or, or whatever. Uh, people need to know if they are not on the invitee list, there will be nothing for them to come to, and they should not come to I, I Thank the, you for that. The communication has been, but we have been clear that if they are not appointed delegates and or alternates, or some of the staff that have been identified that they are not coming in. Um, okay. Not only, stop them not from only the delegates, department. but the yeah. delegates who are invited to come. Yes. Because not all the delegates are invited to come. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Well, we will have six uh, six people from each state. That's the that's the target number, and each state and territory. But some of the territories are not allowed to travel, so it'll be fewer than than three thirty six. But uh, it'll it'll be over three hundred. All right. So, Miss Ashmira, then we still yeah, have Mayor, the safety portion. Oh, I thought Mr. Eggleston said he'd get it offline, but go ahead, please comment. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, I was, I'm was i an alternate, not a delegate, but I got the message some time ago that I should not come to Charlotte, which I thought was fine <laughs> since I did. Uh, and that I'm not part of the North Carolina uh, group, which consists mainly of, of party officials. Um, so it, it's been pretty clear that uh, I should not make any plans to participate. I don't know if it goes as far as emphatically saying do not come to this city, but um, certainly it was plain enough to me that there was uh, nothing going on in which I should expect to participate. Um, that's just one, one perspective. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Ashmira, before we, is this a safety one or are we still on yes, this I, one? Yes, I have a question for Jeff, our health director. Um, in a couple of weeks ago, there was a conversation about having a delegate at hotels instead of just one to minimize or to further the risk. Um, what happened to that plan and how did we arrive at this plan? Or how did you all arrive at this plan? Uh, you know, I'm sorry, you were dear. Was breaking we up couldn't the hear it. Ms. Ajmira, we couldn't understand the question. You have to get closer to your mic. Okay, can you all hear me now? Better. Yes. Okay, great. Well, a couple of weeks ago, there was a proposal where delegates would be, would be at various several hotels instead of just one to further minimize the risk. Um, what uh, what happened to that plan, and how did we how did you all arrive at the plan that you all uh, just presented? I think that that particular plan had um, was was what we were moving forward with when we thought there were going to be more people here, um, with the expectation that they would need to be spread over a number of hotels. Um, having them all at one hotel, with the meeting rooms being in the hotel, except for 
that Monday when they're across the street at the convention center gives us an opportunity to control the situation better um, and to make sure that people are complying. Um, it also reduces the amount of transportation that we have to, to try to move people around from multiple hotels. So when the number got condensed, then it gave us that opportunity to localize it. Thank you, Ms. Davis. All right. Um, I want to thank um, both Dr. Runji and Ms. Harris for being available to us tonight. I think we've covered a lot of ground, and I think what I have seen from your slide presentation and the work that you've presented and the answering of the um, various questions that um, we, we really do have a plan and something, as you said, you'll be able to write about and, um, as a way to handle or the way we handle a large event well in um, this pandemic, during this pandemic time. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Jones. So thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Gibby. The, um, I, I think folks understand that there's this uh, policy uh, group that has uh, multiple discussions during the week. And it's um, very refreshing to have you come and speak uh, with us. Uh, Gibby, so it's uh, thank you for everything you've done as well as uh, Dr. Rungi. So the next uh, piece of the presentation, again, responding to council's questions, <clears throat> is to have um, a discussion about what's happening outside of the facilities. And uh, Chief uh, Jennings will queue it up, but he also has a number of individuals who worked not only through this project but also during the uh, the DNC. So we have a bit of a history here. So Chief Jennings, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Manager, uh, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, I'm still waiting on my letter not to be here for the convention, so hope. <laughs> so um, this started, our security planning started in March of 2019. So you can see we've, uh, we've been into this for quite a while. Uh, although it has certainly changed from what we were originally planning, uh, we are still fully committed, have been, and will continue to be uh, committed to working with our law enforcement partners uh, and other stakeholders to keep make sure that we have a uh, that these, this event is safe for the attendees and also for our community here in Charlotte. Uh, just to get kind of into some of our planning, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department Command Center will operate between Friday, August 21st, and Monday, August 24th. Uh, and we are actively planning for potential events uh, during that same time frame. Um, as you've heard earlier, the Secret Service has designated this as a uh, national special security event. Uh, but the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, we have to break this down into two, uh, two ways of looking at it. One, we have to ensure that the event itself uh, delegates, guests, and everyone else uh, that's attending here for the event uh, is safe and that we're able to uh, manage that event as well to ensure that uh, it's as little dis disruption to our city as possible. Uh, and at the same time, we are committed to make sure that services that we provide from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department to our community who is here uh, is not diminished in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So. Uh, we have uh, we have a strategic operation plan in place to ensure that that doesn't happen and make sure that our city uh, is continued to uh, receive the services from our law enforcement uh, that they've been receiving. So as you heard earlier, we're expecting 336 delegates plus their guests. Uh, and there's no indication at this time uh, of a presidential visit or a vice presidential visit However, if that does change, we do have resources in place and we will be able to manage that effectively as well. So you heard a little bit also the history of Charlotte. We've, we've been fortunate to be able to plan and, and put forth operations for major events. Uh, some, of, some of them and a lot of them that I've been significantly involved in from a leadership perspective. Uh, and so we've been fortunate in that so that we feel that uh, the Republican National Convention uh, is something that's certainly uh, within our realm of, of, of ability to be able to handle and make sure that it's safely put forth for our citizens uh, and the guests that are coming into Charlotte. So we've been working with uh, CATS, CDOT, 
uh, North Carolina DOT, other partners in to help manage that a traffic plan uh, that uh, that will impact based on the plan that's going to be for the secure area. Uh, and the traffic plan will be released later this week so that we can have, so everyone have knowledge of that as well. And we, Mr. Driggs mentioned, I think it was Mr. Mr. Councilman uh, Driggs mentioned the protest and the safety of protesters. Uh, the answer to that is yes, we do expect protesters, demonstrators uh, to come into Charlotte and we are going to uh, uh, hopefully have peaceful protests that, and, and ideally that they will abide by the, um, uh, the plans with, as far as masks are concerned and, and take consideration for their health as well. So, you know, we can't accurately predict the number, number of um, protesters that we're gonna see. It's a little bit different this year, as you've been told and you can imagine, it's a little bit more difficult to know what is actually uh, and who are going to who is planning on coming in for the demonstrations? Uh, but we are going to be appropriately staffed and planned to make sure that uh, whatever we see and we're faced with, that we will be able to handle it and make sure that they're safe and that officers are safe, uh, as well as our community is safe. There's been a tremendous amount of planning, training, coordination, and it's all been committed to the security for this event and public safety for uh, for our community. Uh, and now, in the interest of public safety as well, we, we, we're not going to discuss means, methods, and uh, specific resources. There will be things that will be released after the event is completed, uh, but we want to make sure that we are uh, providing a safe and welcoming um, atmosphere for everyone coming to visit the shop and those who live here as well. So I'm going to end that with any questions and also, I do have some staff here that can answer any specific questions if I'm not able to answer as well. Are there any questions? Ms. Eisel. Ms. Eisel, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, Chief, thank you for the update. Um, I have a question, Chief, when the um, event was scaled down and we were told to scale down our use of the security grant to essentially what was spent. I wondered how that impacts what security, um, what, you know, the, the, the mix of security that would have come here. So between Secret Service, FBI, local, out of state, do we, do we still just have, do we have a mix of that or is it just local or is it, you know, how does that work? There is a mix. The, the National Special Security event does allow for uh, federal uh, assistance as well. So, uh, there, of course, obviously with a scaled down event, uh, we have scaled down the number of, of resources that we have. However, uh, we still do have resources available to us uh, based on, because as you know, that uh, we don't know what we're going to see as far as protests are concerned. Uh, and if it gets to a level of protests where we need further assistance, we do have that available for us as well. Will you have any out-of-state um, uh, officers coming from other police departments? Again, you know, we just have those resources that are available at this point. Uh, we are, we feel sufficiently staffed with uh, what we have in place. Uh, so I don't want to get in specifically about which agencies and, and uh, how many agencies are, will be assisting, if any. Uh, but um, at this point, uh, I feel very comfortable with what we have. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Mr. Mitchell. Mayor. Hey, Chief. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. So just, just three quick questions. One, I think you mentioned that the command center will be open starting uh, Friday, August 21st through Monday 24th. Uh, but I thought Jeff said the convention runs from the 24th through the 27th. Is there a reason we not extend the command center through the 27th of that Thursday? That was originally the, the 27th, my understanding was going to be the acceptance speech and that's done virtually. Okay. Uh, it's in Charlotte will end on Monday afternoon, the 24th. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good news. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, Chief, doing the DNC, uh, the boundaries, and, and I know some of my council members who were not here, but actually it was fenced in all the way center city partners boundaries. 
Uh, will it be the same setup for the RNC? Is that going to be a gated fence around downtown? Yeah, you'll, you'll know a lot more on uh, later this week. However, you can imagine that since there is only one venue, uh, that you can probably imagine it's not going to be as significant as it was during the DNC. Okay. Where we had several venues downtown that were impacted. And, and, and Chief, uh, in 2012, the protest uh, area was where uh, right beside the Westin, it was an old club there called the Cruise. And so it, it was um, a little open spot. So where is the protest area? Have we designated one for the RNC? You know, given, given the idea and the thoughts of how scaled down we are and some of the information that we're receiving at this point about who is coming to Charlotte, uh, at this point there's not a designated uh, protest area that's been okay. set. Now, people will have um, a freedom to be about in, in, a, in and around, not in, but around the uh, area that's secure, uh, but there's not anything designated that we are going to set up. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Mitchell, I recall that we designated a protest area and not one protest took place in the protest area. They moved exactly around, right. so I don't know yeah. that we get to define that as much. But um, I That's tell correct. you, Chief, if you can get the fencing, as much as that construction is going down there, I'm going to really look forward to seeing how you get new fencing in addition to the fencing that we already have out in the center city. Um, so also, uh, Smudgy, that nightclub was called Crush, not Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, somebody knows where the clubs are. I'm glad somebody does. All right, Mr. Driggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Chief Jennings, uh, we've been asked a number of questions about the status of the federal grant on an ongoing basis. So we received information at one point that the, the grant available to Charlotte had been reduced to about $16.5 million. And that was to cover about 14 million in expenses we had incurred and included a provision of a couple of million for security under these new circumstances. So is that still the plan? Is there any capacity to get more money from the federal grants since it's now not committed to Jacksonville? Uh, or, or how do you think that will play out? Yeah, that, that's a very good question and, and one that was actually was discussed this morning. Uh, we, uh, the, the short answer is that I'm not sure. So we're going to submit what we can uh, and the final number of what that grant's going to provide to us will be uh, determined once we have all those submissions. But I think it's going to be close to or the amount that you had mentioned. Because the, the sensitivity is around the question of whether or not there will actually be any cost to Charlotte of security. So are you describing a situation in which there might be? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear your question again. Um, yeah, I was saying the sensitivity is around whether or not there will be any cost to Charlotte. Uh, and um, are you saying uh, by your answer that there could be? Oh, I, I can't answer that right now, but what I can tell you is that we will submit reimbursement for um, all expenses. Uh, did you have something to add? That is correct. Uh, good evening, Council. Angela Charles, Assistant City Manager. We have the opportunity to submit for any additional cost over the original grant uh, approval up until March of next year. And so, again, if CMPD incurs additional costs due to, uh, you know, having to uh, deal with protesters, et cetera, we have the opportunity to uh, submit that for reimbursement. Good, so we're covered, great. Uh, my other question was, the Vice President indicated in Raleigh that the President did intend to come to Charlotte, and we have just been advised that uh, there is no such plan. Now, does that mean that we have affirmative information to the effect that he is not coming, or, is it, or only that we have not had any indication yet about whether he will be here? I don't, uh, be honest with you, I don't think anything's affirmative until Tuesday after the event's over, but uh, I really, I, you know, your guess is as good as mine. You know, daily they, they change things. Uh, and, you know, what I can tell you is if it does change to where either the, vet, the president or the vice president attend, we are prepared for that uh, and we will make accommodations for that. Uh, but at this point, that is something that's not that we're being told that neither are planning to come to Charlotte. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mr. Winston. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem asked my, asked my question. Okay. All right. I don't have anyone else for a question. So, Mr. Jones. That's it. Um, thank you, Chief. Thank you. All right. So we have covered the CAP. We've covered the inclusion, transportation, transit, Republican. So um, and portion. So we have two more. Which one yes. do you want to do first? Uh, so, Mayor, what I'd like to do now is that while the um, legislative update could just be a part of a council committee report out, we elevated it in the city manager's report because um, there's a, a different way of, of approaching it this year. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to Dana, as well as the two co-chairs of Intergovernmental to talk a bit about the, the strategy around um, the legislative agenda for this year. Okay, Mr. Winston and Mr. Bakari and Mr. Fenton, our dream team. Who's thank you, be? Mayor. Okay, thank you. Mr. Fenton, you're going to lead us off? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, I know that, uh, well, first of all, let me say, state for the record that my name is Dana Fenton. I serve as the Intergovernmental Relations Manager for the City of Charlotte. <laughs> being, uh, Mr. Bakari and Mr. Winston wanted to talk about uh, how, we, uh, how we engage with our federal and state and our county and other partners uh, that we do have. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I would like to provide just a brief legislative agenda update just to bring you all up to date on the different things that are going on. I promise it won't take too long. And I, of course, I'll be glad to answer any questions, but uh, well, my intent tonight is not to uh, take any time away from Mr. Picari and Mr. Winston to talk about uh, what they brought up uh, last month at, uh, at one of the business meetings. Uh, we're on the right slide, that's great. Just go over a couple things tonight tell you where the Congress and the North Carolina General Assembly are at this time, talk about some potential legislative issues and where those could come from for your 2021 agendas, and then talk about next steps. Next slide, please. Uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, I'm sure as you all know that since the start of the pandemic, the Congress uh, has enacted into law four different emergency relief measures. And they've been working on a fifth one now for a few months. Over the last week, they've had negotiations. Those negotiations haven't gone too far. And the president uh, took some unilateral action over the weekend, signed an executive order and issued three memoranda in an attempt to try to get the negotiations going. And there's been some back and forth between the parties. And, uh, and they are trying to get back to the negotiating table. I know for some, it may not seem like they're trying to, but uh, in, in this uh, uh, environment that we're in right now, this is what this is what's happening. Uh, also, in addition to the emergency relief measure, the Congress still has an appropriations bill to pass for uh, the operations of the government for uh, fiscal year 2021. They have to act by September 30th, pass a continuing resolution to keep the government going, and you'll probably see an appropriations bill passed sometime after the election. Next slide, please. Uh, the North Carolina General Assembly uh, adjourned their, or convened their short session earlier this year in late April. They adjourned in early July, and they primarily spent their time addressing policy and appropriation issues resulting from the pandemic. Uh, I know that uh, Ms. Babson was up here before talking about Powell Bill and some budget reductions in the State Department of Transportation. Uh, there were significant budget reductions that had to be made in both the State General Fund in the Department of Transportation. Uh, the General Assembly, again, they adjourned on July 11th. They'll be coming back on September 2nd for a two-day session to appropriate any federal funds received in response to the pandemic. And I know that the House and Senate leaders are looking at the Congress to see what they're gonna be doing, uh, to see whether there'll be any additional funds to spend or any additional flexibility in the use of coronavirus relief fund dollars. And like a lot of uh, state and local governments around the country, uh, the leaders of the General Assembly ex have expressed support to the Congress for additional flexibility and how those funds can be spent specifically for revenue replacement. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, when you look at the horizon here, looking ahead to 2021, and you look at the uh, what you all have been doing this year, you have established a number of committees and task forces, and you have empowered your uh, committees to look at certain issues. This is gonna be a year unlike any other year when it comes to your legislative agenda. Uh, you're gonna have ideas coming from council committees. I don't think we, I think so far, we've been monitoring the different committees and task forces that have been meeting. And I, I, I don't know just how many different legislative uh, recommendations have already been made by those groups, but there are quite a few. There's certainly gonna be a lot of issues for the uh, Intergovernmental Relations Committee uh, to uh, consider next month and in October. In addition, uh, we believe that we'll be receiving from members uh, quite a few different requests to take a look at different legislative issues. And of course, we'll also have a request from staff as well. Next slide. Uh, I know that one thing uh, when Mr. Bakari and Mr. Winston speak, they wanna talk about how they're reaching out to other uh, governmental entities here in the area. I want you all to know in about two weeks from tomorrow, the Intergovernmental Relations Committee will be having a joint meeting with, the, with their Mecklenburg County Commission counterparts. Uh, I'll make sure I'll send you again. And uh, they will be focusing on mobility issues. Mr. Jayoga will be presenting a briefing on the Charlotte Moves Task Force. And then there's also gonna be some community members <laughs> talking about uh, greenways uh, and how those fit into a mobility system. And next slide, please. Uh, in September, uh, September 21, the committee will meet a regular type of meeting and they'll be hearing requests from uh, uh, committees, council members and staff, what, what legislative requests they have. They'll re uh, convene again in October to propose state and federal legislative agendas for your consideration. And during the month of November, uh, uh, the committee uh, will be center stage with the council on three different dates. Uh, at the strategy session of November 2nd, the action review on November 16th, and we're planning for adoption of the agendas on November 23rd. Next slide, please. And uh, after the adoption of the agendas, we can transition to implementation of, of the agendas, and we're already planning on briefings for our congressional delegation and state delegation. Uh, and we are, just so you know, we are trying to, we are targeting uh, sometime between December 7th and 18th for a briefing for our state delegation. We'd like to do it early this year because the General Assembly convenes in mid-January and, uh, and to try to meet with the delegation in January or February is almost impossible because of the uh, different time constraints that they have. <coughs> Excuse me. And next slide, please. Well, I think, I think that's the last slide I have. Uh, and uh, with that, Mayor, I'd be glad to answer any questions, but I'd, I'd probably be better for me to defer to Mr. Bakari and Mr. Winston at this point. Any questions about the schedule or the schedule parts of this? And we'll go to the floor by recognizing Mr. Winston. Uh, yes, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, so as uh, Mr. Fenton said, uh, this year is a year like no other however um we will to a point we will try to do things the same uh we have a, a tried and true method that gets us results um at the state and at the federal level um we anticipate our uh, legislative agenda uh will look very similar uh, we will have about five or six items uh that we bring to our delegations however as mr fenton uh laid out we have a lot more than five or six issues that I imagine we will need some type of uh, legislative action on the state or federal um, uh, uh, level uh, to help us uh, get our work done. Uh, so what me and Ms. Uh, Bakari uh, have been working with Mr. Fenton and our, our other colleagues to do is how do we speed this up? How do we, well, how do we start this process a little earlier? Um, we have our COVID response. Uh, we have, uh, on top of uh, on top of the bullet points that um, Mr. Fenton presented to us, we also have uh, the audacious uh, task of reimagining uh, government's role uh, in, in in safe communities and community safety, as well as taking a different approach uh, uh, to um, uh, public health response to dealing with violence. There might be a need uh, for legislative actions there. We don't know yet. 
Um, so as we're doing this, we want to give staff a chance to think outside the box. So we've been reaching out to you, our colleagues. We sent, we laid out our process earlier in the summer. Uh, we sent you an email last week. Um, over this next month, we'll be working with Mr. Fenton uh, uh, to figure out how do we um, create buckets, right? How do we create buckets that are possibly going to separate or that we will separate from what might make our legislative agenda uh, versus how do we create a workflow in our intergovernmental um, uh, 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 committee uh, and, and create a framework uh, that works on those issues and gives council members, gives staff, and gives our COVID response um, a, 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 a good chance to get all of those things done. I will say, as Mr. Fenton um, um, showed you, that we have are looking at a, a intergovernmental uh, approach uh, to transit and, tr and transportation investment um, with the county. I encourage um, all of our members, especially those that are on the Transportation Planning and Environment Committee, uh, to come and participate um, in that meeting. Uh, that, uh, my color, uh, the legislative requests that, that, that you have or, or, or just the, the work that is, is getting done. I will also say uh, that Mr. Bakari and I are working uh, to find how do we be um, actors, uh, participants and partners in a consolidated effort um, around the upcoming uh, CMS school year. Again, while we might be um, on passengers on, 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 on that journey, um, again, it will be good for us to understand uh, what we will need to ask for from a legislative um, agenda versus uh, an intergovernmental approach to the work that we do. So um, if you have not been in contact with myself, Mr. Bakari and Mr. Fenton, um, letting us know your possible uh, legislative requests or priorities as we go into this process, please do. Uh, this next month is going to be very important for staff and us uh, uh, to use that time, um, effort, and resources uh, to, to really kind of uh, uh, grab a hold of all of the issues uh, that we have on, on our plate in front of us. Um, I'll leave, leave it up to Mr. Bakari uh, to fill in any holes that I left out. No, that was well said, Councilman Winston. I would just add one little tiny piece around all that, which is we, we have worked to progress and evolve intergovernmental relations in the process over the last three years. And I think we've, we we and staff, Dana, everyone that's been part of that, Mr. Eggleston beforehand, have all done amazing work. And the difference, again, we said it before, and we'll say it one more time, between the last couple years where we formalized the process, the rails, the ability to move on certain items that are hot and put other items in parking lots and try to, you know, figure out how to, how to water that garden so it could one day become hot enough to move on has enabled us to get here. This is evolving to the next step this year, and um, and and I cannot emphasize enough what Councilman Winston just said. The next month and a half is the most important period of all of that. Um, if you haven't, uh, today was a big milestone. If you haven't sent um, your items, your buckets, your high-level visions of what needs to be included based on all the uh, topics that we are seeing right now, particularly from a COVID perspective uh, and, and economic recovery, um, we really need that feedback. And the next month, month and a half, is going to be the next evolution of what we do. Again, it is, it is not saying here's a laundry list staff of 15 things very specific that we want included or maybe included. It is here are the major topics that we want outcomes achieved in. And um, I, it, it is my opinion that in the past, and I think Councilman Winston agrees, we have in some ways hamstrung staff by giving them a laundry list of very tactical items to consider, and they spend their time figuring out, can we do it, or can I explain it back to you as it relates to why we can't include that right now? It, it, it's very important. We're not going to say you, you can't submit those, but we very much want to find the macro buckets that Councilman Winston was, ju was just talking about, where staff can be unleashed in this next month and a half to go figure out what the art of the possible is. Because it, it, the legislative agenda, in my opinion, has never been more important than it is going to be over the next year. Um, right now, we are dealing with significant problems, many of which we are not authorized to solve on our own. So I would just add that on to Councilman Winston's points and uh, close it there. All right. <clears throat> are there questions 
Um, I, I just wanted to mention two things. We've got a governance committee of citizens that are going to come to us. I don't know if they will require legislative action or not. And also the mobility committee when we're talking about funding of our walk, bikes, all of that. So they're probably not going to meet the deadline of next month and wanted to make sure we left some room in there for their um, opportunities for, and when they come forward. They'll come to council first and then going forward. So. I, I uh, Mayor, just just to that point, um, uh, we understand this, and this is why we, you know we are trying to work in this kind of uh, this idea of buckets, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know we ha I know we have a lot of, of ideas around mobility. Uh, for for instance, Council Member Watlington has has um, uh, uh, talked for a couple years uh, about um, uh, uh, taxes um, uh, to, to help Steel Creek. Um, uh, deal with the mobility and transportation um, infrastructure investments that are happening there. Again, this is something that I think needs to, that we can talk about in the greater bucket around our transportation, um, um, uh, uh, not just agenda, uh, but how we uh, really uh, kind of put our strategy together to deal with it. And how, so how do we bucket it up where we're able to deal on the micro level um, those, those many different things that are going to be needed um, across our city and our region, um, but still, still making um, perhaps one singular um, line on our uh, our legislative agenda related to uh, transportation mobility. Just to add to that, because I think that this is the point that really has to be emphasized in the change this year, which is we usually treat the intergovernmental staff and the process of getting this legislative agenda formed as an afterthought, if I can be quite frank about it. It is, it is usually something where everyone has their other committees, their other things they do, and they see, oh, the deadline's coming up. I need to give some ideas if I have some. Uh, and the buckets in this approach at a high level enable us. We know that we're not going to be able to know everything until months down the road, but we need to unleash Dana and this staff now on important topics because, for example, Councilman Winston and I have already agreed on one that is going to be a focal point for the two of us, and that is the digital divide. And we know there are things that are going to come out as we learn more and the feds and other partners and other counties are doing, particularly rural, urban, other things like that, the 74 corridor, uh, many other related items. However, we know at a bucket level we want Dana and the, and the uh, intergovernmental staff uh, that he uh, orchestrates with to start working and compiling what these other groups are doing now, right? Because we know there are many things in the General Assembly, uh, many uh, other counties, other groups that also are working on coming up with things. It enables Dana not to be responsive on 75 things with one week before the deadline that this thing has to be crafted with this approach now. But it only works if all of you start really thinking about it now and, and providing the high-level buckets. Right, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor. Dana, as a follow-up, I know the state engaged in a disparity study. Um, it, I think it would be helpful. Uh, I know some of us are very interested in that. So if you can provide an update where the state is as it relates to a disparity study, could be some conversation for this council as well. Thank you. I will. Thank you. I don't think there are any other questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Watlington? Yeah, I was just gonna offer up that I think if we, and maybe you all have already done this, it's just a suggestion, but. Ms. We Watlington, look, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? That's better, yeah. I was just gonna offer up, and it may have already been done by the chairs, but if we think about our major buckets, um, that our committees are organized around, maybe that's work that we can take from out of the committee and just say, what are the things that we know that we said were priorities for this year as council? And what are the things that fall within those existing buckets? Like you already mentioned transportation, housing, e workforce business development, uh, safe communities, uh, governance, those kind of things. We know that those are buckets that we're working on within our sphere. So if there's anything from the committee standpoint that folks have wanted to lift up but knew was outside of our immediate authority, I think that we could go ahead and add those to the list. Right. Okay, I think that's um, the end of the legislative agenda update. Thanks.
thanks guys for thinking through it in a way that is more policy focused um, and legislative policy driven. So thank you. Um, so are we ready for our next one, which is our COVID-19 update on city response and recovery? Yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the council. I'll begin this presentation and it's uh, in response to some of the questions that came up the last time we were together around um, expenditures to date and what may be left in some of these uh, various uh, areas that's related to the coronavirus uh, relief fund. So two items we'll do today, that is um, to review the uh, funding as well as discuss the um, expenditures to date. So I, I do want to start off by uh, going back to where we were uh, back in May, I think it was May 11, when I provided a uh, memo to you that um, showed what was available in terms of some of the uh, CARES funding. I believe the information came out May 2nd and we were able to report back to you by the 11th. And it's really two areas that we started off with and that is operations and community support. So under operations, a lot of that uh, deals with our employees. And from the very, very beginning, we've discussed protecting our employees and continuing to provide core services. Under the community support, it's, it's easy to divide it up into um, a couple of the task force actions, you know, business around small business and around housing. But we were also able to shift some funds from um, the operation side over to the community support side because of our ability to use FEMA funds and that will uh, occur again tonight. But where we are right now is um, focusing really on the community support as well as operations. And I do want to talk a little bit about operations and protecting our employees and providing core services. It's important to note that uh, right now, as we ventured into the beginning of June, the first two weeks of June, for the most part, uh, we had operations back in service. Um, the last time we discussed this, we talked about first responders who never really uh, throttled back at all. And then we had to make sure that our team, in terms of operations, that they were safe before they could come back to full uh, operations. In other words, we did those A-B shifts. We made sure that we uh, slowed down some of our collections to make sure that we could have our employees safe. I will tell you that uh, as of today, we've had 146 employees have tested uh, positive for COVID-19. And that's, I'm sorry, as of August 8th. And right now, 96 are currently uh, quarantining. And about half of those folks are our first responders. I will say that we would like that to be zero. Uh, when you start to think about having 8,000 employees and uh, year to date, we have 146 employees that have tested positive. That's a, a bit of a matrix or a data point that I wanted to share with you. I think what's also important is that as, as I talked about those first two weeks in June, when we went back to operations, full operations uh, with the First, making sure that we had the proper protections for employees. About 75% of our employees are reporting to work every day. Uh, the other 25% are working remotely. Um, and with those 75% of employees that are reporting to work every day, we're doing things like staggered start times, uh, reporting directly to work in your vehicle, not having to, to punch in or go into an office. So again, we're sticking with not only providing those core services, but protecting our employees. What's also important that I wanted to put out today is that in terms of financial management, we have about uh, 60 employees less today than we had at the start of this. And for the most part, it's uh, due to this hiring freeze that we've had. But I want to uh, bring you up to date in three areas. One is if we go back to April where we started to think about our revenues and I mentioned to you that because of sales tax and the way that 
sales tax did not have to be reported until July and that there's a two month lag in terms of sales tax and I could not give you a, a very good update before the September October time frame. I will tell you that the, the first couple of data points um, is sales tax while it's been off it hasn't been off as much as we had projected we were thinking to be uh, down as much as 25 percent I think the last data point and, and Ryan will pop up, up some, at some point t tonight and we may have a new data point with sales tax but um, the last data point I have is that we were down 18 percent and no one's excited about being down 18 percent but when you're carrying um, being down 25 percent that's that's a little better than expected in terms of the expenditures uh, I, I commend the entire team in terms of uh, making sure that we control the expenditure side as best that we could by limiting our, our expenditures again protecting employees providing core services but also limiting our expenditures and as we start to talk about some of the operations in the CARES funds and how they've been utilized we've been able to charge as many eligible costs as possible and that also helps us I say all that to say that uh, I'm confident that we will end the fiscal year FY 20 in the positive range as opposed to in the red which basically means that we would not have to go into fund balance to balance the books for the period ending June 30th of 2020 again but that's been a collaborative effort with the entire team but I'm always going to go back to protecting our employees first as well as providing uh, core services this uh, bubble chart you've seen over and over again but I think it's important to continuously put it out in front of you these are our CARES funding to date I put the the catch funding and the aviation funding in yellow uh, again because those aren't impacting the general fund um, and those are for our two enterprise funds and it's very different with those as we go to the next slide that those two uh, allocations actually can be used for um, support their normal operations where we can't with the other CARES funding that we've had up to, to this point I know that our, our CFO um, she would love to get some guidance Kelly Flannery to get guidance that would basically say that we could use some of these funds for revenue uh, replacement it's not the case right now but as uh, Ryan speaks with you later our, our budget director and again uh, kudos to both of them in terms of helping us manage through at least the the end of FY 2020 is that um, if any opportunities arise around being able to use some of the CARES funds for revenue replacement that's very different than having to spend it all by December 30th anything that is used for revenue replacement for anything that you budgeted could result in you having resources later on that do not have time limitations and if I butchered that Ryan he'll clean it up when he comes back uh, the next slide is just really to, to put it in front of the council that we've been talking about this a lot um, as a matter of fact there's always something on the agenda that uh, relates to COVID-19 whether it is uh, Chief Johnson and Chief Graham or, or me or other members of the team uh, we try to continuously keep you uh, up to date even beginning with that May 11 managers memo that, that I um, alluded to earlier the blue dots are basically uh, the different task force meetings that have also occurred during that time and if and if the count is right I think it's a 26 different meetings so there's been a lot of work trying to make sure that we are taking care of employees providing core services but also getting these resources out into the community especially in the, the housing area and small business and, and workforce development the two yellow boxes I, I bring to your attention because on June 22nd we were able to uh, free up some additional CARES funds by charging some of our costs which are allowed to FEMA and we were able to at that point free up 3.5 million dollars which 
the council approved that same night for um, the summer learning program with the YMCA as well as public Wi-Fi. Tonight, the August 10th box, there are two items that are on the agenda. One is that you have an RCA for $6.9 million in additional ESG funds, um, which is just awesome. Um, and I think you will hear from one of the, from a task force, some of a recommendation for using a, a big portion of that 6.9 million tonight, but also uh, through hard work, we're able to free up another $3 million in our CARES funds because we're going to charge that $3 million to uh, FEMA. So if we go to the next slide, um, again, this CARES Act allows the city to request, request FEMA reimbursements, and we're going to do that for the second time tonight. For the first time, June 22nd, the $3.5 million was, uh, again, used for the programs that I discussed earlier. Tonight, for your consideration, is another $3 million, and combined, that provides $6.5 million of additional capacity from the CARES funds for what we call community support. So I think we have a couple of charts on the next slide. So um, community support, again, we talked about the uh, June 22nd, where we had funds for bridging the digital divide, 1.5 million, great job, Renee. Uh, we're working through that. Um, I think we're actually starting in the Beatty's Ford uh, Road Corridor and the Youth and Teen Opportunity Centers with the YMCA. We've been getting very good uh, feedback from Todd Tibbetts and the Y. So, go to the next slide. Uh, for tonight, um, what I try to do, and this may not be a comprehensive list, but listening to council members uh, and going back with some of the discussions that have occurred during strategy sessions and business meetings and committee meetings and task force meetings, I try to provide a, a list of uh, areas that all make sense, in my opinion, that could be, um, this $3 million could be uh, used for. So last time we were together on the 27th, there were discussions about support for arts and artists, as well as utility relief. Um, but also there has been a series of discussions about support for homelessness and housing, and that's come from the task force. Um, support for the hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels, that's been previously discussed. Uh, youth athletic activities, again, as schools are going uh, virtual, what are the things that we could do, especially in the corridors around uh, youth and youth athletic activities? Uh, employee assistance uh, with, with daycare, I'm going to come back to that, um, but th there's also been questions about additional support for public Wi-Fi as well as additional support for small business. The employee assistance for daycare, I've had uh, discussions with the county manager as well as the school superintendent, and I believe more information is coming out as it deals with um, opportunities for, and I try, make sure I use the, the, the right words, for those uh, families that are going to um, work and school is going to be virtual, where do those children go who may not have an, um, the oversight at home? So what we've done with our own employees, and uh, Sheila Simpson's here tonight, it started off with a, a survey to see um, what the needs are or in other words, are there some employer, employees who would find it difficult to come to work because of potential uh, daycare needs? And so we're continuing to uh, monitor that as well as talk with employees about the various options that could be available to them. Um, it, I've made it very clear with department heads that flexibility is extremely important in these unprecedented times and because our uh, employees have been able to be with us through this. We've, we've had no layoffs. We haven't had any furloughs. We've continued with uh, premium pay for those uh, operations and first responded um, employees. 
but still we need to continue to make sure that we're taking into account um, their family situations uh, through this. So um, before I turn it over to, um, to Ryan, I just want to talk a little bit about where we are now versus where we were at the beginning. So the May 11th memo, we roughly had $70 million for what we call community support. So outside of the CATS allocation, outside of the airport allocation, and that $70 million was split between um, the Small Business Task Force, $50 million, and the Housing Task Force, $20 million. Um, with the actions tonight, um, what, and I'm sorry, the, and then contingency, $14.5 million has been just left in contingency. A lot of that, when we started off, was that we were trying to get to September and maybe even the beginning of October to see what would have been the changes, if any, or what would be the need. So we've always set aside that $14.5 million for what we would call the unknown, and, and it's still setting out there. But tonight, instead of having $70 million for community support and um, $70 million for city operations, by the time we do the two actions, the first FEMA action that was, um, well, the first FEMA, FEMA action, $3.5 million, and then the second FEMA action, another $3 million, we would move another $3 million over to the community support side, which would end up being $76.5 million, and then $63.5 um, million would be left for city operations, um, which, again, uh, Ryan will walk you through that $63.5 million, and then we're going to have uh, Tracy, and I'm not sure what the, the order is, but Tracy, to walk you through um, what has been uh, allocated so far from the um, Small Business Task Force, and then Pam to walk you through what has been allocated and what's going out the door as it relates to the Housing Task Force. But again, over and above uh, just this 156.54.5 million dollars, we've had ESG funds. We've had some um, you know, reimbursements that have gone to FEMA. So if you start to, to look at this and the, the total spectrum, there's been a lot of resources that have been pumped back into the community. I will tell you, we also took a quick look at the other uh, jurisdictions that got the direct allocation. So, it's, so Houston got the most at $404 million. Atlanta got the, the lease at $88 million. And those for those cities, and I think Atlanta got in at the end there, those cities that have 500 um, um, residents or more. And we're pretty consistent with small business, rental and mortgage relief, emergency response. That That's pretty much through all of these cities. Some folks have done some other things around arts and culture, food assistance, um, homelessness, COVID testing. But for the most part, I would say that the council is consistent with many other communities that had these CARES funds direct, directly um, allocated to them. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ryan to discuss city operations and what we've spent up to this point. Good evening, Mayor Council. Um, my name's Ryan Bergman. I'm the uh, Strategy and Budget Director. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through a little bit uh, specifically our operating support, but I wanted to start with this slide because we've had a lot of different presentations. We've talked a lot about each of these individual buckets, but we haven't put it all in one place. So this is the Coronavirus Relief Fund, the overall plan. The manager mentioned how we started with 70 for operations, 70 for community support. Uh, through the FEMA actions and uh, the ability to uh, charge things to FEMA there, we've been able to uh, transfer some of those funds to community support. Um, so what we're left with is the 63.5 million in operations. Um, and, and I'll talk specifically on the next slide about each of those categories within operations. But um, the gist of it is that we were able to charge $17.3 million in the responding piece through FY20, and then a little bit in the adapting piece um, for a total of 17.7 million, um, which uh, 
as the manager mentioned, uh, did allow us the opportunity to potentially end FY20 without a deficit, but also to take care of many of the needs uh, that I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, the next piece is the community support piece where we had the 50 and $20 million allocations. Um, Tracy Dodson, Pam Weidman will provide updates on each of those during their section, but I also wanted to draw attention to the additional support. So this is the 6.5 million that the manager referenced, which is outside of the task force's purview. Uh, it took care of the uh, public Wi-Fi program. It took care of the summer, summer learning centers, which uh, if approved tonight with the FEMA ordinance, will allow $3 million for council uh, to make a decision on, make a recommendation on with, uh, without impacting the rest of our plan. And, and then finally, before I move to the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about the contingency. Uh, the city manager did have it correct, um, but uh, the other thing I'd like to add about that is the state and several other jurisdictions are also holding funds in contingency for two reasons. One would be the possibility of revenue replacement. Um, if you follow the uh, federal legislation that's out there, both the Senate and the House bill had some form of revenue replacement. Uh, whether they make a deal or what happens beyond that, we're not sure, but for now, there's certainly at least a possibility of it. And the reason that's important is because if we're able to reimburse ourselves for the lost revenue that we had, reimburse the taxpayer for the lost revenue is the better way to describe it, that would allow us to potentially turn back to council and ask for recommendations on what they would like to do outside of CARES Act restrictions. So if you think about some of the things we were talking about at the retreat, uh, which were, uh, and I won't go into details on them, but program enhancements we'd like to talk about and council priorities, which ended up having to uh, either be reduced or eliminated because of COVID and the financial impacts. Oh, and then the other, the other mention uh, for contingency is the Senate version also provides an extension of the existing funds. So if that were to happen, and I believe the extent, the uh, Senate version would extend it through next fall, fall of 2021 for us, that would mean that uh, we would have that money contingency going into 2021 uh, for additional programming. So here's the details on the operations piece. I'll talk specifically about the responding piece mostly because that's more of the reactive piece and that's where we were able to charge most of our money in FY20. So CARES Act has two pretty key restrictions. The first is that it will not allow us to do revenue replacement as been mentioned, but then also it won't let us pay for anything that's already accounted for in the budget. The one important exception to that is it does provide us flexibility around first responder staff. So what that means is fire, for instance, if we take an existing firefighting, firefighter crew and they respond to a COVID-related uh, medical emergency, we are able to charge their salaries, their regular salaries. It's not overtime, it's their regular salaries. The reason that's important is because that allows us to uh, reduce our end of year expenditures by getting reimbursement for normal costs. And that, that's what really allowed us to be able to potentially end FY20 in the black. Uh, beyond that, the, uh, the other types are certainly above and beyond expenses that we've had. Uh, hazard pay, uh, which is premium pay as we call it, uh, we're able to reimburse via CARES Act first responder hazard pay. Uh, and then emergency leave, which is a, uh, a benefit that the manager uh, recommended for employees that council approved giving the manager authority for, uh, which provided two weeks of uh, paid time off uh, for 